6 30 p.m oh. okay thanks okay folks good evening all and welcome to the Montpelier city council it is about 6 30 p.m and uh, <clears throat> and we have a quorum um we ex may expect more council members but for right now we already have a quorum so we can get started and i'll start by asking Councillor Brown, who's appearing remotely to identify herself. Hello, Carrie Brown, District 3. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll mention a couple of uh, meeting uh, logistics and expectations. If you're appearing uh, remotely, please change your name to indicate your first and last, last name displayed on the screen. Um, anyone who speaks to address the council, please state your name and where you live at the beginning. So we will have that information for the minutes. We ask you to keep uh, all comments to three minutes. And if you're speaking about a specific agenda item, keep your comments germane to that item. Anyone who wishes to speak must be called on by the mayor. You may ask questions or make comments, but if you have multiple comments or questions, please get them all out at one time. And I think we're ready to go. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Any any changes to the agenda? Hearing none, we'll move to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. And again, we uh, limit the comments to three minutes and Councillor Bate will assist us with uh, timekeeping. Um, I don't see any hands raised in the uh, uh, online, so I'll start to see, uh, ask if there's anyone in the room who would like to address the council. Yes, Tom. Hi, my name's Thomas Moore. I live on Prospect Street. You may need to get closer to the mic. Is that close enough? And I should be... Uh, Tom, let me hold off for a minute. Minutes. <laughs> okay. okay, you haven't started yet. Okay. I, uh, uh, Councillor Hurl is on the uh, on the meeting, so I'd ask Councillor Hurl to identify herself. Hello, Lauren Hurl uh, from District One. Thanks. Thank you, and uh, I'll just uh, a note for the public: if because some of the members are appearing remotely, if there are any uh, divided votes, will, they'll have to be done by roll call. Tom, you're up. Thank you. Start the clock, Tom. Okay. Um, Thomas Moore, Prospect Street. I want to bring up a topic about uh, homelessness and a little bit about the other side of it. Because right now, <clears throat> I have taken in a family of three, two adults and a 13-month-old baby. <clears throat> Cutest little boy, I'll tell you. The teeth coming in. But I'm 61, and I can't handle a baby. <laughs> um, the, the story, um, the problem is, is that they're, they're living in my house and trying to get housing for people. The, the real story on this, there just isn't nothing. Okay. There's nothing. I have called every organization. I have gone to these places, to their doors and the answer you get. Sorry, no housing, can't help you. You know what? They don't even take my name. They don't even take my number to let me know if there's anything. It's very frustrating, you know, because uh, I don't know if it was a couple years ago, we gave $400,000 for some homelessness and stuff. And I'm telling you, it, to be paying that kind of money and these organizations are just, the answer is, nothing it's like why are we even giving that kind of money for that and then not to have any callback or anything and it's it's just terrible how you get treated trying to help out somebody and uh, and and the money that i have seen I, one place you know tells me that well they have to fill out a 44 page application, 44 pages. I go buy a house from Tim. I don't, I don't 
44 pages. Come on. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. No wonder they don't want to go into these places. And what I'm trying to keep it under three minutes, we'd like to suggest that if we, we, the voters do approve another big chunk of $400,000 to do it, instead of just handing it out, you call and you get, sorry, no housing. We're not, we're not getting anything for it. What I would like to suggest is maybe we take that, this money, put it to the side and tell these organizations that if you place somebody, we will give you $5,000 out of this 400,000 for placement. We're not just going to give it to you to say, sorry, there's no housing. Or another little suggestion maybe is if we could give maybe landlords a $5,000 credit towards their property taxes for placement. You know, a landowner, uh, you know, might say, well, geez, that would be half my property taxes paid for if I put in. And we will see the results, what we get. You know, if we only get 20 placements, Thanks, Tom. you know, we're not going to spend $400,000. But Thanks, I'm Tom. just telling you, it's so frustrating. I, I definitely you know? hear you. And we're spending a lot of money. We Thanks. need real results. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. It, it, just, Tom, just, first of all, I agree with everything you said. Second of all, just so you know, we did set aside $400,000 to be used for some potential project dealing with homelessness, but we have not spent the money yet. So, so we had, no money has gone to any agency. State okay. still yeah, spending. I understand. Spending. I just want to be We're clear about the 400000 results. Mm -hmm. I mean, take somebody in and you'll see what I'm really mm -hmm. talking about. Gotcha, What's, Tom. Okay. Thanks, Tom. It's your message is received here. And thank you. Stephen. Stephen Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, I want to snarkily congratulate you on having tolerated our staff and commissions. Homelessness Task Force over four years has accomplished zip towards this effort. Uh, not bathrooms, not showers, not places to plug in phones. Same with the uh, toilets committee, a uh, year and a half or two, they've been in business and accomplished zip. So I think the failure is on you because you're the responsible parties or your predecessors uh, for having demanded some accountability out of both the city manager and the boards and commissions. And it's just not, it's just not happening. Uh, I asked Commissioner Haney to put on amend the agenda to direct staff to come up with public toilet options uh, at the next meeting, uh, pros and cons of each, because the toilets committee is not doing it. And uh, for some reason, nobody saw fit. I think it's a disgrace that people are still outside in this kind of weather, in the heat, in the pouring rain, and even in the winter. And We've done no planning. We've got no effective plan to deal with this. I'll switch to public works. I've pointed out they did fix the valve today, but they left a big gaping hole blocking half of the street, forcing the traffic over to exactly where the drainage doesn't work, which throws it on everyone walking by on the sidewalk. So they left it dangerously low below. Wait, you know, we're not going to put eight inches of asphalt in there, I hope. That would be a huge waste because we got to tear up the street again next year anyway. So just the mismanagement, the gross mismanagement of our public works. You know, I've two days ago contacted public works and said the drains clogged here. No, no action. I emailed y'all a photo of the drain clogged yesterday. Now it's backed up all the way across the fire station and all the way up to, you know, Bo the drain at Bohemian. You know, why, if we had the vacuum truck here in town to, to work on that, why couldn't they have sucked out that drain? It's just, the, the oversight and the mismanagement of managing our public works department is the problem here. And y'all are complacent status quo instead of holding his feet to the fire and get these things resolved. So it's, it's disgusting really. And it's expensive. Thank you. I just say that after receiving, so Mr. Renick didn't tell people about the after they've gone home for the day. We addressed the journey first thing this morning, fixed it. And uh, obviously, the studio is 
caused the problems. So I don't know what the status is of it now, but it, they did respond to his concern. Thanks. Um, anyone else in the room? Yes, come on up. Shorter than everybody. Um, Kim, can... Kim Ward, uh, I live here on Main Street. Um, and I would echo some of the frustrations other people are uh, talking about tonight. And I have had people who are family members who I have also housed as Tom has. <clears throat> and the the issues we all know are really dire. And I feel like some of the problems could maybe be resolved if we did something like a helping people with their zoning or their ability to put an extra apartment in in town, um, allowing people to put tiny houses on their properties. I've talked to people in town who said they wanted to do that. And then the mortgage company wouldn't let them have a second property on their, on their property and things like that. So that kind of a solution, I think, could help us integrate people into the community rather than trying to find a pocket to shove everybody. Um, and it feels like there's a lot of roadblocks to that right now. And then it may be, you know, many cities are dealing with this across the country, but it's but it's a it seems like that's something we should be focusing on as well. Um, and I, I'm on the restroom committee and and I would say that um, as somebody who's worked with Lost Nation and we're trying to get like 24 seven bathrooms open here in the city hall, I know that there are concerns about that, but we have doors that lock people out of the rest of the building so that they could use a bathroom that's got some dignity and some running water, um, that that should be something that we're moving forward more quickly on. That's all. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the room who'd like to address the council? And I do not see any hands raised uh, online. I don't always see everybody. So if anyone else on the council sees someone, let me know. Okay. We will move on to the consent agenda. Um, there's a uh, we're going to pull off item H, the water system hydraulic analysis, amendment number three. Um, and does any council member want to remove any other item from the consent agenda? I, I would like to request we move, uh, we remove uh, letter I, the budget to actual report. Okay. Anything else? Okay, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of items H and I. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda is passed with the exception of items H and the I. So shall we take up item H right away, uh, right now, the water system analysis? Sal, do you want to start that? Uh, yes, I, I um, was hope, hoping, I, ha I hadn't heard really a, an, an update recently on where we've still, we had a couple of reports, we haven't taken any action. Uh, I imagine we're waiting for something from the state, but I was hoping to get a bit of an update. Yep, uh, thanks. So since we had the last meeting, Okay, I'm not controlling that. Last politely. Um, so, go further away. Okay. Um, since we had the last meeting with the state, uh, there has been several back and forth between our consultants, state engineers. Last Friday, our public works director met with the director of the water supply division to kind of go through this. And as a result of that conversation, we're expecting to get a new set of comments from the state with perhaps some revisions from the earlier comments. Uh, those could be coming as soon as tomorrow or Friday. Uh, at that point, we'll obviously share those comments publicly and then we will respond and that will guide the steps we make. So there's been a lot happening in between um, the last time here, just not necessarily visible. Uh, but those final comments, and then that will lead to a final actual engineering report. Once we have the final comments, that gets 
approved and that will then lay out the projects that we are seeking funding for and that sort of thing. Uh, obviously, we're pushing as hard as we can on this. Uh, I'd also note that this, um, in addition to funding additional work as a result of this process taking long, this, this item also funds uh, designing uh, adjustments to our hydrants so that they are reduced pressure so that the hydrants themselves meet the pressure controls. So um, we are addressing at least the hydrant deficiencies in um, with this particular amendment here. So this some of this is in response to the state's comments. Well, right? some of it is to design, yes. I mean, it's all in response to these issues. Some of it is immediately to do with the hydrants and the other is to pick up the extra work that we've had to do as a result of the extended process with the state. It's gone much longer than it was anticipated. It's usually typically state asks us for a report. We provide it. We get one set of comments. They resolve it. And that's the end of it. And this has taken longer. So obviously more consultant time. Well, I appreciate the update. I know a lot of folks are are following the issue, and uh, I know it's taking longer than we had hoped. Um, I'm right. hoping that it's yeah. No, it's very much a front burner issue for the city, and it is. Uh, but you know, we need to have a, an approved report that we can then use as the basis for the projects that we do. So the proposal. Uh, on the agenda is to authorize the city manager or his designate designee to uh, execute amendments to uh, number three and uh, or amendment number three. And I wonder if uh, there's now a motion to uh, approve that. I will move to approve. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Now we can move on to item I, the budget to actual May report. Uh, Councilor Brown, do you want to start this off or do you want to just ask? Yes, you? I do. I just had, I just have a question. Um, I, I appreciate all the information that was in there and the, and the detail and everything that was very helpful. Um, but I'm just kind of wondering what happens if we end the year with a deficit? So um, I may call on Sarah to help, but uh, I don't think there's a lot of words for deficit. So the deficit would be just that we budget, we spent more and got in less than our total budget. It doesn't mean we need any deficit, like we, we'll still have a positive firm balance. Can I interrupt you for one second? It's really hard to understand you, Bill. I don't know if it's your microphone or if you could move back a little. Or... Is that better? No. No. Yes. Nope. When I'm back, how's that? That's great. Okay. All these years of being told to speak right into the mic. Um, okay. So uh, uh, there's the budget to actual deficit where you you know you spend more than you budgeted and took in less, um, and then there's an actual deficit where you you actually are in the negative in terms of cash. We will not be in that situation. We'll so um, and what we would do simply is this: if we if we end up in a budget deficit, then that will erode our fund balance by that amount. And you know, last year we added to the fund balance pretty significantly. So some of that is offsetting this. I mean, it's just the timing of the way some things hit. Uh, and typically, what we would do is try to manage this coming budget a little tighter uh, to try to catch up. Uh, as much as we can, uh, we may not be able to get all of it, but uh, that's how how we do. We will not be in a a deficit deficit. Great, thank you very much. Okay, and Sarah's nodding her head, so I must have got it right. Anyone else on the council on this topic? And I, it looks like this doesn't require a vote. This is just a well, report. Typically, the vote is simply, uh, this was a recommendation of auditors several years ago, that there just be a record that the council received. But at one point, they, you know, you, you are the overseers. You need to see regular financial reports. And there was no proof that you had. So now we put them on the consent agenda just to so you receive them. So it's in the minutes that we can show that elected officials are getting regular financial statements. So, okay. So if you could just vote to accept the report. That's all you need to do. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second. 
Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And anyone opposed? Okay. With that, we've completed work on the consent agenda, and we can move to item six, the update from the Com Complete Streets Committee. Let me get the light. Okay, you're on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Corey Lyon with Public Works. Uh, I also and the staff representative for the Complete Streets Committee. Uh, with us is Holly Fowler, member of the Complete Streets Committee. Uh, we wanted to do a update for the council about what the committee's been, uh, what have they been doing and what do they plan to do here in the future. Um, also have a uh, potential um, funding proposal for the committee to, or the council to consider uh, for FY24. Um, I will hand it over to Holly. Good evening, Council. And I'll ask people in the back, can you hear uh, the speakers? Great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, if Complete Streets is a new concept to anyone, um, it is a well-established uh, smart growth approach to planning, designing, building, obviously maintaining streets. Um, the premise of these is that uh, they are streets that are accessible and safe and still efficient for all types of users. And so sometimes folks think that complete streets are just about pedestrians and people on bikes. It is not. It is also meant to be inclusive of multimodal transportation and um, uh, as well as motorists driving cars as well. So this is really a concept for everyone. Um, to be mindful, all ages, all abilities, all modes of transportation. The Montpelier Complete Streets Committee was formed in 2016, um, and our primary activities are hosting events, conducting outreach, uh, promoting education around uh, complete streets, safe seats, um, doing advocacy with partners, uh, and basically partnering on other related initiatives. Um, I would say here that you're, you'll see in this presentation a number of partners that we've been working with. Um, a very close ally is Local Motion, um, which we're delighted um, to have based in Burlington and services all of the Complete Streets related committees throughout the state. Uh, currently, we are seven members uh, that sit here for those who might not be able to see the screen. The members of the committee currently are Brett Apel, myself, John Kim, Hanif Nazarelli, who is also our liaison from MTIC, David Ori, Scott Richardson, and Nancy Schultz. We also have two open seats currently on the committee, and we have had up until recently a student representative who was Merrick Moden. Um, and so those are available seats. Um, tenures are up there, or term dates are up there as well. I would say that after probably an initial, my six months on the committee, we were trying to establish some stability of committee members. And with that, I think is an indication of why we've been able to get the traction we've been able to get recently in terms of our impact. The last time I was speaking to you um, was on this topic, but I'm actually gonna let Corey speak to the most recent update uh, regarding the Berry Street two-way public bike lane. Uh, yeah, we wanted to to bring this up. The Complete Streets Committee um, was uh, were very heavily involved last year with this project, um, and it's the extension of the recreation path on the south side of Berry Street. And this specifically is the, the short term implementation um, with markings and, and bollards, while the um, long term uh, implementation is being designed and. Um, 
with all of the, like I said, the Queen Streets Committee did a lot of work on this, and we had every intention of implementing this last year. Um, we ran into some difficulties with contracting the work. Um, we are now more well equipped to do this in house and uh, have every intention of following through with that this year. And um, and uh, may rely again on on Queen Streets Committee to get the word out and. Um, prior to uh, to doing it, if the rain ever stops, um, you know, we'll be out there. Okay, so just to provide you with some highlights of what's been happening, uh, we have been a partner to the e-bike lending library that's been conducted with um, the, the, the real library, Kellogg Hubbard, as well as Sustainable Montpelier. Um, we've seen the addition of uh, five bike hitches uh, to downtown Montpelier, we helped and supported the screening of a Safe Streets documentary uh, with Well Told Films. They are a locally based um, producer, director uh, couple here, and we did that in the Christchurch courtyard. We hosted a group glow ride at night uh, just around Halloween, and we did that with Local Motion. We had about 30 folks, all ages, uh, come out, costumes and all, um, and basically try to promote both uh, confidence in riding around the city at night, but also making sure that folks are wearing everything they should be wearing to be seen well uh, as it gets dark. We have uh, traditionally held a Be Bright at Night initiative, which again uh, rewards uh, pedestrians, cyclists, et cetera, for, for wearing lights and reflective materials to help be seen by motorists. Um, we typically promote safety-related public service announcements on Front Porch Forum. I'm gonna tell you more about a couple of recent community-based events, which have been a bike rodeo and a series of workshops um, to help folks feel more comfortable in, uh, in cycling and being familiar with their bikes. Complete Streets participated with Local Motion at Transportation Day at the State House. Um, and we worked with uh, Montpelier Police Department to update the bike registration form to make it easier and more likely that folks would actually fill out a bike registration form for when bikes go, go missing. Uh, if you missed it, uh, in May at the high school, we had 38 young cyclists and their families come out uh, to do a bike rodeo. And uh, lots of folks had no idea what a bike rodeo was, um, but it's basically a series of stations that the youth ride through um, and get some instruction. Things from riding straight, not riding straight, stopping um, at lights, navigating when there's a bus coming, et cetera. Uh, what was really phenomenal about this is the support that you see there from all of these community partners who got involved. Um, and I won't go through the, the whole list, but it's, uh, you know, public and private. Uh, and uh, it was a pretty phenomenal day. And um, lots of folks asked us if we would do it again next year, which I hope we will do. Parents also wrote me personal notes to say that their um, the, their children felt so empowered after this event that they rode all the way down East State Street and home again all by themselves, um, which to me was enough uh, for having spent a lot of hours trying to to organize this. But we're deeply appreciative to all of the partners. Um, Nancy has helped lead uh, this six series of uh, workshops that have been held here in City Hall. Um, and actually, I think the final total was um, an average of 12 people attending, but a total of 22 unique individuals who attended at least one part of the series. Um, and it has definitely helped to show that there's a lot of demand for community rides in addition to what the ones are that Onion River Outdoors uh, organizes. Um, and just generally great community for in demand for in-person events. So we feel like we're on a roll. Um, I won't go through all of these photos, but there's a story behind each one of these. The glow ride is there, the e-bike lending, the documentary um, reporting on different issues that show up on Front Porch Forum from, from anyone. Um, we, we cycle those through our agendas. We talk about them. We relay them to Corey where he's able to help. And um, it feels like we're getting some really nice traction um, and we're not doing it ourselves, but Part of this is to say thank you. Um, by reinstating our budget, um, we have been able to leverage already more than $1,000 in external funding and sponsorships. So by being able to say we are able to do this, 
other people like the Kiwanis and uh, Northfield Savings Bank got on board and said, we want to help you do this. Um, so it has helped us to produce new programming, re reintroduce past initiatives that had gone by the wayside for a couple of years, um, attracting the attention of new partnerships. The Point to Point Ride has reached out and asked us to support them in September for that. Event. And then, um, yeah, it just, it feels like with your support, we are able to show up in a much more professional and compelling way. Um, and we are now seen kind of as a model for many other cities and towns in Vermont for the work that we're doing. Um, and I can't say enough about Corey. He is continuously present at all of our meetings. He helps in a very efficient way to help us through different questions that we have, challenges that we have. Um, and it's been a real gift to have been assigned a city staff member who shows up and really helps. So thank you very much. I'd also like to call attention to Evelyn who works um, with the committee on a few different things and she's really she's really helped them as well. Um, and I also wanted to mention that there's um, been this, I guess, unexpected benefit from this committee for staff and that's, um, you know, when they're out there doing all of this, they're having conversations with the general public. And those are conversations that folks may not be comfortable having with staff or with counselors. And they're able to, that kind of act as a, a conduit from the general public to staff to bring up whatever uh, substance may be you know, of those conversations. And it's really helped us uh, address some things and, and have some discussions. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's been, and, and like I said, it's, it, I don't think we ever really expected it when the committee was formed, but it's, it's been great. Thanks so much. Any members of the council have any questions or comments? And you could go ahead and unmute, unshare. I can better leave this to Oh, I see. Stop sharing. Down okay. Down. Well, why don't you share it again? Bill has a question. Sorry. I I was just going to ask. Corey um, knows what I'm going to ask. I just like to know. Uh, I don't know. I want you to could you just go over the Bay Street project again. The reason I want to do that is here. That was a this. Sorry. Um, thanks. Is that better? Okay. Could you just review the Barry Street project one more time? And the only reason I asked that is, you know, that was a decision made a few years ago and we had an extensive public process and now we're getting to it. So I want to make sure that the city council and the public are hundred percent clear on what the plans are because um, we will probably hear about it when it happens. And so I want to make sure that we've been I mean, you you have done nothing wrong. You guys have been great, but just one more time to walk us through it again. Yeah, no, it's you know, it's it's thanks. Been a little while. Can yeah. I ask you to wait just one moment? Uh, I've been noticed notified that uh, Councillor Cohn is now present. So Palin, if you would just uh, introduce yourself since you're appearing remotely. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, this is Palin Cohn, District Two, um, City Councillor. Thank you. Okay, sorry for the interrupt. So um, a few years back, the as Bill said, the, the city underwent a pretty extensive um, scoping study that included uh, the uh, Barry and Main intersection, Main Street, basically the entire length to the to the roundabout, as well as the uh, extension of the recreation path. And from that study. Um, the short-term uh, recommendation was to convert the south side of Berry Street, the parking on, parking on the south side of Berry Street, to a, a two-way bikeway in the short term. Um, that would be done with striping and bollards. And the city, a couple of years ago, received a grant from the state to design and construct the long-term uh, recommendation, which is an extension of the actual recreation path from Main Street to the, the rec center, and then back to the to the uh, Stonecutters Way crossing, and that was the recommended, um, I guess, fill in the gap of the of the recreation path. So that is under uh, design right now and on um, track to be constructed next constructed next year. Uh, and as I said, our our plan is to construct the um, the short term 
uh, recommendation this year. Thank you. Thanks. Any comments, uh, Donna? Well, I just want to thank Holly and all the committee. Complete Streets has been very active and is an incredibly important conduit for pedestrians and bicyclists with our infrastructure, as well as programs to educate. It's, it's, a, it's very, very valuable. And indeed, Corey, the Berry Street modifications of the demo we're putting up, I have brought up a council's report, but it's nothing like seeing it. I mean, it's really helpful. Your, your whole slides have been very helpful in your presentation. And I would certainly hope that we will support giving you the money because it's well spent. Anything else? Steve. Yeah, briefly, I wondered if we, Steve Whitaker, I'm up here, if we should rename it to Complete Streets and Sidewalks. We've got an increasing competition between uh, inexperienced users on new powerful electric bikes using the sidewalks. And we have, I'm not an expert on our ordinance, but I know that the old folks that I frequently talk with are terrified of the amount of traffic. We, I got almost got clipped today on school street sidewalk, uh, somebody who doesn't even announce I'm on your left, I'm on your right, but the electric bikes, especially, I'm not sure they, sh we shouldn't enforce keeping them in the road instead of on the sidewalk. But I think this is a group that could do a lot of education around that. And it, it's a nice fit with what they're doing. I applaud their work. I think that's a good point. I think, uh, rather than take the time to look at the ordinances, we will look at it because I know there are, there are some rules about what's allowed on the uh, sidewalks. Yep. Education and awareness. Mm -hmm. Dan. Hi. Dan Jones, uh, Northfield Street. I am, uh, I guess there's one street or per perhaps two streets that I find do not be part of this because as a bike rider, uh, downtown Main Street, State Street are shall we say, uh, terrifying oftentimes with uh, the way that uh, cars come very close to you when you're trying to follow the rules. Uh, so I would like to see if that, that could be in, included in the future. Excuse me. Secondly, uh, where are these bike stanchions that are supposedly downtown? I, other than the signs, I uh, you know, the square metal signposts, I have not been able to find any. Uh, am I missing something? The, the hitches. Yeah, the hitches. Yeah, they're they're around uh, Main Street and State Street in a number of locations, and there's also a variety of bike stands. But we have a we actually have a map that we've been working on where we can show where different amenities for cyclists are. Um, so we can make sure to share that as part of. Uh, if, I think it's you, typically if, included if, in if, our if minutes. You could, because agenda. locking a bike downtown is oftentimes a bit of a stretch. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, is is it those ovals that are yes. welded to some of the parking meters? You put a sticker on them to say this is a bike hitch because we weren't sure if folks would know that that was okay, right? Because we don't assume that it's known that that is okay to lock your bike to, but point taken. And I think there's a plan for additional bike hitches, right, Corey? And I don't know, should we say anything about the relationship between complete streets and MTIC? Um, yeah, I think we so the, specifically the hitches. I think we did five this year, and we were looking to do a few more this year. We don't have an exact number though. Um, and um, yeah, so I guess it goes back to what I had mentioned about um, the complete streets committee members and and the observations they make and the conversations they have with the public. And that only gets filtered to staff, but. Uh, we do have a member that is a member of both committees. So they're making recommendations or, or um, you know, passing along information to the infrastructure committee as well, uh, as well as staff. Ms. Come on up. Hi, Kim Ward. I live on Main Street and I live at the downstreet department. And I'm wondering if you could clarify for me, where is the intersection between no pun intended, how the Berry Street Main Street intersection for driving is going to end up, as well as all these crosswalks, which I almost got killed in the additional crosswalk one night. Both me and the driver were trying to be very cautious, but with two crosswalks across Main Street, 
he looked, I looked, we both went and he came inches from hitting me. Um, and I know that there's more plans, but I'm a little, I'm not clear about like all the biking, bike path stuff, as opposed to the driving that's going to go on or the lights. Mm -hmm. Corey, so, do you have an answer? Yeah, I should have mentioned this uh, when I when I mentioned the um, the Berry Street path. But so at the same time that that is being designed, we are also under design for the traffic signal at Berry and Main Street, um, as well as the state is also under design for the reconstruction of the railroad crossing at Berry and Main Street. So they're all working together at the same time, um, and all sort of dependent on one another. Um, and as of now are on schedule uh, to be uh, construction, constructed next year. Because the railroad crossing has to be done before we can do the traffic signal. Right? Well, it has to be done at the same time. Basically okay. the, the, the components will interact with each other. There'll be detection that'll activate the traffic signal if a train is present. So it all kind of works together. Okay, gotcha, thanks. Anyone else from council or the public? Okay, we have a request to approve the uh, budget expenditure of $5,100 from the parking fund. Is there a motion to approve that? Donna. Make the motion, yes. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, thank you. We have thank you. approved the budget request from Complete Streets and we are now up to item seven, Gove Community Garden. Welcome, Paul. You know, Paul is coming up. I'll mention this is an item that almost could have been on the consent agenda, but uh, who was, you know, we can never miss the chance to have Paul uh, regale us uh, at a public meeting. So we decided to give him his spotlight. <laughs> do you want me to do a little like intro kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be good. First, I want to recognize we have a number of people from the community garden here. Raise your hand if you're here from the community garden. These are all folks. These are all folks who have plots at the garden. And Paul, yeah. why don't you state your name? Oh, my name is Paul Markowitz, a resident of Montpelier, and one of the members of what we call the coordinating committee for the Gove Community Garden. Great. So I, I have a few just to give you some context. Less than five minutes, and then questions. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds all perfect. Right. Great. Um, so we're really excited to be here tonight. I was looking through my emails and this process started about a year ago, almost, um, when we found out that the owner of the Gove Community Garden, Donnie Gove, uh, was in hospice, and uh, he has since actually passed away. And so we reached out to the uh, person who has um, a power of attorney and now owns the land, a woman named Tina uh, Gallison, and uh, approached her about uh, because their plan was when he died to sell the land and that's what their plan now. And our risk, our concern was that if they sell the land, that the new owners would not, you know, care so much about the community garden and we would lose our access to the community garden. So um, we approached her about the idea. We actually originally talked about the idea of a conservation easement uh, and they came back to us with, well, we'd actually like to donate the land to the city. Um, so just some context, the parcel is about two miles out of Montpelier. You know where Pearl Street Motor Sign is? It's like community garden right there on the right. So, um, but really what this project is about is about securing two acres of prime ag land uh, to maintain in perpetuity as a community garden or and or agricultural purposes. Uh, basically, we have a parcel that's in the floodway, in the flood zone, uh, would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to build on. Uh, uh, you know, it floods in the uh, in the springtime. Um, uh, we currently, we have about 
20 gardeners, many of them represented here today, about 30 plots or so. Uh, the garden's been there about 35 years or so and has been owned by the Go family, and they have generously uh, leased to us free of charge every year. And as I mentioned, we only approach them because of this, uh, I would call it a um, significant event in the timeline of this property that the risk of potentially losing this community garden. So after we approached them and they said they'd like to donate the parcel, we kind of got our gears in motion. Uh, we formed a co coordinating committee. There's three of us, myself, uh, two other people, Michael Verla and Jess Young are on the coordinating committee uh, to give us a little bit more structure, a little bit more, um, what's the word to say, um, organization, if you will. Uh, we set up a coordinating committee. Uh, we have a bank account. Big news, we have a federal ID number. We've established operating guidelines for all the gardeners. We're as close as you can become to uh, being official uh, without being official. Um, and we've secured the, the support from the landowner for this whole process, subdividing the land uh, and then um, donating the land to the, to the city. Um, we obtained a grant from the Conservation Commission, which we're very thankful help cover the cost of a survey that was done by um, a Gilson survey company. Um, and we basically now have a two acre lot, which essentially was the minimum lot size required. And it actually corresponded with the exact uh, dimensions of the garden. So that worked out really, really well. Um, we filed for, and we've actually received our subdivision permit. That was about uh, three weeks ago or so. Uh, uh, the permit was issued on Friday. We went before the DRB a couple, three weeks ago, and we actually now have a subdivision permit. We're in the 30 day waiting period right now. And this should be official if barring any comments, this should be official starting on uh, July 23rd, at which time we would um, have a signing um, a ceremony with the current landowners uh, for the new deed. Uh, we prepared a deed for the new plot that's been signed off by the landowner and the city attorney. Hopefully you have the latest uh, version of that. Uh, and tonight we're basically seek seeking the city council to approve ownership of this two acre parcel uh, with our goal is to have minimal, if actually zero uh, involvement by the city because we have a governing committee to maintain the garden. Uh, we're not looking at city involvement except to hold this land in public trust. Uh, the good news is that this land would, it has river access, be welcome for people, there's a parking area. People would be welcome to come, go to the garden, go down the river, uh, you know, sit by the river, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanna give special thanks to uh, Chris Hammer, a resident of Montpelier who really led the whole process in terms of the subdivision requirements, getting the, the survey done. And also to my uh, my colleagues, uh, Michael and Jess, for being on the coordinating committee and basically helping us get our whole act together with making the garden a little bit more efficient. I think that was it. So uh, comments, questions, I want to keep it short. Thank you for your clear and efficient presentation. Any comments or questions from the council? We have to thank the Go the representatives of the Go family. It's a very nice gift. And, yeah, uh, yeah, very nice thing. gift. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just I think stories. I tell a short story because stories uh, say a lot. Um, so Donnie's father, I can't remember his first name. He allowed the garden to happen in uh, 1995. I believe was about the date. Uh, and then um, when it became clear that Donnie was, you know. Uh, in hospice and had limited time on this planet. Um, we shared with Tina, the um, person who has um, power of attorney, we shared with her a uh, sign that we now have at the garden. It says Gove Community Garden, a sign that um, uh, Jess and Eduardo actually made. And we shared a sign and they, for some reason, didn't know that we had named the garden the Gove Community Garden. And they saw the sign and then she took I get made, we made her copy the sign. She took it up to Donnie, who was in the hospital, showed him the sign, and actually reported that he actually cried when he saw the sign. And at that point, she was just like, this has to happen. This Donnie's wishes that this land 
you know, continue with the garden, continuing his father's legacy. And, um, uh, and we're just almost happy to, you know, make, see the fruition of this happening. So. Um, I don't know if this should be directed to you or to Bill, but is there, is there anything in, if, since the city is going to be the owner of this property, is there anything that says that the members of the, that it's going to remain in use as a community garden or? Yes. Thank you very much. So in the deed, we have a covenant in the deed, which restricts the land to only be used as a community garden. It's actually named the Gove Community Garden or for other agricultural purposes in perpetuity. So basically with this covenant, uh, land could never be developed. No, no permanent buildings can be put on the spot. You know, there can be garden like sheds and things like that can be done related to agricultural, but it cannot be, there can be no permanent structures on the land. And is, is it served by the, uh, by city water, or do people just go to the river to get water for their uh, for their plots? Uh, we we get our water from what God gives us from the skies, which we've had plenty of in the last couple of weeks. Maybe more than we want, and uh, from the river. Yes, uh, I mean, in the future, we're talking about exploring other things, such as like a pump and a well and stuff like that. But that's no, there's no city water out there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Donna. Thank you and all the gardeners, because that's what really made it happen. The owners and the gardeners. So thank you. So, well, I, I'm happy to support what it appears to be an extraordinarily uh, committed group of gardeners. Um, would this then become part of the parks department or how would that work? It's really intended to be managed by the community garden. We did have them. I think you were working up some sort of system for how people could get in. I We've had good conversations with them and supported the effort. And I think the, the one, my one request was, I said, I don't think the city government wants to get into the business of deciding who's, who's gardening, which plot. And so if you could come up with some system, and I believe they've done that. Uh, okay. more satisfied. I mean, we've worked through um, the head of the parks department, like through the, when we had bills, we submitted them through ALEC. Yeah. But as I said, this is, we think of ourselves as relatively autonomous. Uh, we've been doing this for 25 plus years, and we want to keep it that way. And right now, what we have is an assurance in the future that we don't have to worry each year, are they going to let us garden there? You know, it's like we're now starting to like, we can have permanent structure, you know, gardening structures at the garden. You know, we can make investments in the infrastructure to, you know, sustain the garden. So, Great. So, Sal, you move to approve it. Is that right? Yes, I was here. We'll move to approve it. Uh -huh. Any other discussion? Well, if not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And anyone opposed? All right. Congratulations and thank you. Gardeners, let's do it. Thank you very much, all. Okay, next up, we have item number eight. The decisions on Country Club Road. Okay, 
You're on. Hi, uh, Josh Trome, Community and Economic Development Specialist with the City of Montpelier. Um, and just before uh, we get into it, just for almost the last 10 months here uh, for a lot of council updates, I've been sitting next to Stephanie Clark, who's not here. You might have noticed her change over the last nine months or so. <laughs> um, and uh, happy to say that she did uh, finally give birth on June 16th um, to Adelaide Antonina Clark, um, eight pounds, zero ounces, and daughter and mother are happy and healthy. So she wishes she could be here. But we have um, <laughs> Dave Saladino uh, from VHP, um, who is just as good. So Dave. Hope so. Yeah. Well, that's great. And convey our congratulations, please. Okay, thank you. Um, again, David Saladino with VHP. And um, Going to try to stick in the uh, the theme from the last presentation and keep this relatively um, short and sweet. Uh, the information here is very similar to what we were presenting last month. Uh, what's new here is now we now have the final report that has been issued, um, all 300 pages of it. I'm I'm guessing nobody has read through all of it, so really wanted to just walk through kind of a, a high level overview of the report itself, and then and then uh, dig in a little bit on the recommendations. We've got some slides. We'll talk through kind of the next steps where this plan goes. So you can see on the, the title here, this is an actionable master plan. And so the idea is really to come out of this uh, taking action as we move into the next, the next phases. So just, uh, just a reminder, you've probably seen this slide a few times. Just uh, this is where we've been. So starting back in uh, last, last spring of 22, community input started on the, uh, what would happen at the Country Club Road site. Uh, fast forward into the fall is when the consultant team came on board. Uh, we had our first round of public in, uh, input back in the fall, some due diligence that we'll, I'll touch on briefly. Uh, then over the winter, our second round of public outreach, we looked at opportunities and constraints on the site uh, on Country Club Road. And then uh, we just wrapped up the spring round of the third round of public outreach and um, uh, integrated all of those comments into uh, the final uh, plan and uh, report itself. And then just to zoom in here on the phase one timeline, uh, you can see here our two, our last two visits here. So March 22nd and May 24th uh, here. Oh, oh. Sorry, this guy down. oh yeah. There it goes. All right, that's better. Um, Okay, so so uh, there are two visits here, along with the um, uh, the development of the final report and the public meetings, uh, bringing us to here tonight on on June twenty eighth, uh, presenting the final report. Uh, let's see. Oops, I'll jump back here. So um, here is the report overview. It's it has ten chapters uh, and an, uh, an extensive appendix. I'll just walk through a couple of the things here. Executive summary. First section summarizes the report itself summarizing the goals for the site that have been developed through public input, staff input, stakeholder input, uh, the findings from our due, due diligence uh, assessments, the preferred concept plan that was, that was recommended, and then a summary of the recommendations coming out of the report. Uh, then getting into the body of the report, uh, starting off with some background and history, the purpose of this study, uh, acquisition of the property, the due diligence, and then the master planning process. Uh, then moving into community context, specifically talking about the need for housing, the, the housing crisis, the needs in Montpelier, of which we've, we've heard a little bit tonight, uh, as well as the needs for recreational, additional, additional recreational amenities in Montpelier. Uh, and then uh, a detailed summary of the public process. As you can see on the right here, we did have the three rounds of public outreach, fall, winter, and spring. Each of those rounds, there were three sets of public meetings, so in total nine kind of touch points in uh, in different formats with the public, as well as online surveys and other opportunities for, for input. Uh, then the due diligence summary here, we particularly focused on um, natural and cultural resources, uh, traffic, and the existing, uh, the Elks Club building itself, uh, an overview of that, that facility. And so those are all summarized with the entire uh, reports, the summary reports included in the uh, appendix. Uh, community response. So all of the feedback that we received through those nine uh, nine public meetings, as well as online, uh, are summarized and fairly extensive uh, response to community uh, comments. Uh, chapter seven gets into the actual concept plan. As you recall, we we developed three alternatives and sought input on those three alternatives and uh, to identify which concept to move forward with. Uh, the one we we. Uh, 
inevitably went with that, that at your last meeting you endorsed was the concept A, which is shown here on the right. Uh, then chapter eight gets into the costs, estimated uh, high level costs um, for uh, both the uh, on-site and off-site infrastructure improvements, as well as some of the costs that have already been put into the, uh, the, the project and the property. Uh, after the cost, then how, how to go about financing those, uh, those improvements. And uh, as you recall, Stephanie talking about TIF and the water and sewer fees at the last meeting, those are the two primary sources of, uh, of revenue, in addition to any particular outside grants or uh, general, general fund dollars. Uh, and then finally, here we get to recommendations for next steps. And um, so here I did want to go through uh, a little bit more detail um, in terms of the tiers. And so what we did as a consultant team, we uh, uh, kind of bundled these into three different tiers, short-term, mid-term, and longer-term actions. And um, just to note that the short-term doesn't necessarily mean it's a higher priority. It's just something uh, that six, uh, sequentially should be happening before things in the mid-term and longer term. Uh, there's certainly opportunity for the plan, uh, city staff planning and, and others to be uh, moving things around between the different tiers. But we try to do our best to kind of articulate when uh, in the, over the next several years, each of these actions should, uh, should occur. So starting off, um, and I apologize, this is, uh, this is a PDF version. I had an uh, had animation that just went bullet by bullet. So there's a lot of text here all at once. Um, just to, to, uh, to kind of walk through some of these, these are the, the short-term actions. Uh, probably first and foremost coming out of this, and this has already started, but is really um, uh, reviewing and prioritizing these recommendations and getting them into the work program, uh, uh, staff work program for next year uh, uh, to tackle these recommendations coming out of the plan. Um, maintaining accounting best practices for, uh, you know, the potential reimbursement if, if a TIF district is sought after both either municipal or state, um, having those good uh, financial records will be, um, be very helpful for that process. Um, continuing the recreation community uh, zone process and that working group that is underway. And, and if you recall, we, we carved out a 12 acre zone for community and recreational facilities. So wrapping that, that process up. Um, another working group here, the Abenaki working group, there were some meetings on site with some representatives from Abenaki uh, nation and uh, continuing that discussion and talking about ways to integrate uh, whether it's on this site or elsewhere in Montpelier. Um, Looking at the permit implications, um, so reaching out to uh, the Natural Resource Board, DEC, and others to talk about um, the permit implications on the site, uh, engaging uh, Washington County Railroad, Vermont Rail, uh, to talk about the grade crossing, um, initiating the zoning, uh, rezoning process for Country Club Road to, to allow for dense mixed-use housing, community facilities, and so forth. Um, engaging with ACCD to talk about uh, either extending the city's growth center or applying for a neighborhood development area within this district which helps to streamline some of the permitting and uh, opens up opportunities for additional funding uh, in this area. Uh, and then as needed, procuring additional uh, professional support uh, to move some of these steps forward. That's, uh, that's tier one, so tier two, midterm. Um, so starting those conversations with potential development partners. Um, if you recall, this is not gonna be a city constructed uh, um, uh, development, really be looking for development partners, whether that's one or a series of several development partners. At this point, really engaging with those, uh, those partners uh, to talk about potential development opportunities. Um, creating a mobility working group and um, hearing about the complete streets committee that may that that could potentially serve as this working group, but really an opportunity to talk about opportunities to enhance the accessibility to the site, uh, not just for automobiles, but for all modes. Um, continuing conversations with the butters, they've been very active in participating in the in conversations. So continuing those conversations. Um, there were some tanks that were found on the site. So conducting additional environmental assessment and remediation for those sites uh, adjacent to the, the maintenance garage. Uh, continuing or conducting that feasibility assessment of a TIF district, whether at a municipal level or state level. Uh, and then integrate, continue to integrate parks in the discussion about uh, uh, recreational uses and trails and potentially uh, other uses on the site. And then finally, the longer term actions, um, starting here with a housing needs assessment. Uh, this would be really important for any of the development partners to have a better sense or for you, the city, to have a better sense for what the exact types of needs are um, on the site. And so that you can help guide those development partners in, the, in that direction. Um, 
there were some sensitive, potentially sensitive archaeological areas um, kind of outside of the areas that we had identified for development. But should something happen that uh, comes close to one of those areas, we'd need to conduct a phase one archaeological assessment to do some actual uh, in the ground digging to see if any uh, uh, um, uh, remnants or relics are, are found in those locations. Uh, looking at subdivision alternatives that uh, comply with the zoning and also can align with the discussions with the development partners. Um, a secondary access, so a secondary roadway that you may remember, may recall up in the northwest corner, we had two kind of um, dotted lines for potential connections. So further exploring the feasibility of those connections. Um, and then these last two are really getting into the nuts and bolts of the actual uh, development itself. And so developing a request for proposals and RFP for those development partners, soliciting uh, input, feedback, and the proposals from those uh, uh, development partners. Uh, and then developing that clear process, uh, kind of an open and um, inclusive process to evaluate and select uh, development partner or partners uh, who then can move forward with the, with the project. So that, um, that is kind of in a nutshell of the report, and I think we'll just um, end here on the questions. Um, again, you've seen most of the content at previous meetings. We just pulled it all together into, uh, into this report, uh, which has been, um, is available on the city's website and um, at this point, I will I will stop and, and take questions or comments. Great, thank you. Um, I think that this gets us to where a number of members of the council of the community have wanted to get to for a long time, which is we we've heard for a long time. We've heard people say, "Well, there are all these questions that we don't know the answers to, and how can we possibly go forward unless those questions are answered?" and you're not, I don't see you providing the answers to those questions tonight, but you're clearly laying out what you think the questions are that, uh, that would need to be addressed and how uh, we're going to go about addressing them or how you recommend we go about addressing them for the next stages of the process. And so I think this is a uh, very, uh, very productive to, uh, to have brought brought this to us, and so just with that comment, I'll I'll start to see if there are any members of the council who have questions or comments that they'd like to raise. And I'm particularly interested in if if there are people who think that there are questions that are not really addressed by uh, by the plan that you've uh, brought to us. Tim, should we start with you? I don't want to put you on the spot. I just thought I saw you raising your hand, but. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Peripheral vision. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, this is a good outline. Uh, questions, the, the numbers, the potential costs, are, where did those numbers come from? Are they just... The, the infrastructure costs? Yeah. Uh, those were primarily, uh, we, we worked, uh, between BHB and Black River Design, we worked on costs. We did most of the kind of roadway utility costs. Black River looked at the, the building costs. Mm -hmm. um, again, very order of magnitude at this point, but uh, those those were um, based. Their their engineering costs are based on linear foot, based on uh, bid prices, unit bid prices. Previous experience. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Do you think we should uh, un unshare so that people can see each other at this stage? I, if, if there are people who think who would rather have it on screen, that's fine with me. But okay, thank you. The other. Question I had just in, in terms of the, the outline. Um, so it looks like within the topic of um, permit assessment, is that, I mean, that's the piece we need to get to next in a lot of ways to guide whether we need the second road out. Yeah, there's a couple of things. There is, yeah. this is uh, Prime Ag, uh, mm -hmm. is designated Prime Ag land. And so that's maybe one of the more important conversations okay. to engage with the Natural Resource Board, the DEC, and uh, uh, Agency of Agriculture on those that question. So does like the water sewer utility piece fall in under that? Or it's it's not anywhere else in the list. So I'm kind of curious as to where all that fits in. Yeah, the, the water and sewer is more of an engineering problem or not really a problem or an engineering feat as opposed to a prime ag soil which is going to be much more of a back and forth engagement with the regulators um so that engineering is certainly complicated but that's that's pretty standard to design you know extension of water and sewer mm -hmm. um the negotiations back and forth on the prime ag that could be a little bit more uh, uh nuanced so where do we start assessing what it's going to take to get 
you know, the utilities to the sites, so we can get a sense of those costs. Is that where does those that- are in here? Yep, yep. So I, actually, in addition to our, so we we had estimated the costs from Route Two to carry the water up through the site, and um, we worked with GPW to get the costs to extend to to meet up from the Country Club Road site to the existing facilities. So we did get costs from between DPW and ourselves. All of those costs are built into the the eighteen million. Okay. All right. Thanks. And so, um, a couple of things. Uh, this is probably impossible to answer, but maybe an estimate. Um, there, there's there are a lot of stuff on these three tiers. You, you folks have some experience with this a project of this scale. About how long is the timeline for these for these three tiers? I'm just trying to yeah. set some expectations. It's a good question. And and I guess you're thinking about when do we get to a shovel in the ground? Is yeah. that kind of the, the finish line? Um, it's it's hard to tell because there are a lot of unknowns, sure. you know, the prime ag soil, the development partners, how how engaged are they? How um how how um fast do they move? The TIF district, if there's a TIF district, that that's a process in and of itself, rezoning. So I mean I would say three to five years would be my my guess. And I'd look at that feel about right to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we were initially thinking that um, we would be able to begin sometime in 2025. Hmm. That's quick. But your guess is better than mine. I, 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 I was thinking it would probably be three to five years. Um, I mean, it's really a question, you know, coming right now out of the gates, it's really how much focus is on this process, you mm-hmm. know, and, and, you know, certainly could be done in two years, um, but it's just a matter of how much, there's only so much staff time that can be dedicated to these next steps. And so that's, that's part of the question. And then some of this is out of control, you know, the, the TIF district, the application that takes some time, rezoning has to go through a public process. So there are some variables in there that could, could take longer. And would it be possible for certain certain parts of this, say re- recreation and community, to to happen earlier? Absolutely. In the process. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think maybe that's what might happen in twenty five. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, the other Mike, Mike, do you have an answer? That, do you want to fill in on this one? Yeah, Mike Miller planning. I just wanted to. Um, our our goal has been, and my experience has been from working in, in Barry City on a number of large projects like this, uh, we try to break them into bite-sized pieces, plan, prepare, implement. Mm-hmm. We're just wrapping up plan. You know, I always say one year for planning, one year for preparation, and then you move to implementation. This is going to be a little bit bigger, but we did get our planning done in one year, and we're moving into that preparation step, which is going to be all that permitting and engineering and designing and um, you know the TIF districts. There's a lot of moving parts here, but uh, you know as Josh points out, you know we're going to be sitting down in July to start to lay things out, and you kind of start, you know, what do we have to get done to put a shovel in the ground, and then work your way back to where we are now. And so we're going to be putting that that goal of uh, getting a shovel in the ground in 2025 and then working back. And the reality is it may get pushed for some reason, but it will never happen in 2025 if we don't plan on it being in 2025. If we just leave it open and and say, we'll get to it when we get to it, it, it tends to then get left off. So this has been a priority. We want to keep it a priority. To keep it a priority means, um, you know, we have the time and the resources of staff time to continue to press things forward and to bring them back to council. The key of having this document, having this master plan is that we can now come back and say, you guys have agreed what we want to try to do as a community. Now we can start moving forward and say, to do that, we need to rezone. Here's your new rezoning that would make this happen. Uh, To make this happen, we need to go and do a TIF district, which means we first need to do growth center designation to change our growth center. Here's your growth center application. We need you to approve it. And we're just going to keep coming back with, here's the next thing, here's the next thing, here's the next thing. Because we've agreed on what we want, we can move forward without. Um, and if we reach a roadblock where we say, all right, we've, we've hit something that's, that's an issue. We can't do this. We need to make a change. Then we'll come back and say, here's the adjustment we need to do. 
to keep moving forward and advancing the project. But our goal is to sit down sometime in July to lay out what we need to do. And our target is going to be 2025. We'll let you know if <laughs> there's something that says we can't do. But no, I found that in my experience, we've done a lot of big, I've done a lot of big projects. Um, and it's just, just from my experience, um, I was on the city place project in Barry city that was built in three years um, from idea to getting it built. Uh, Enterprise Alley was four years. That one took extra long to, it was a, it was a brownfield, almost a super fun site. Each project is going to have its own special thing. Well, but I know, don't I see a reason it should take six, seven, eight, nine years. We should be in getting started. It should be a shovel in the ground. It doesn't mean the whole thing's built in 2025. There's a shovel in the ground to start building in 2025. Sure. Well, it's good to set aggressive goals. I, I agree with that. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and I, I understand the the purpose of the public process. I think it was was successful in many respects. Uh, and I'm happy to have what appears to be a, a fairly comprehensive list of of actions that we've all sort of been waiting to <laughs> waiting to take to see what will actually happen. What what does uh, worry me is the, is the term master plan. Um, everybody I talk to takes it just plainly too too literally. They they think this is what we're going to build, and we're not. So I I think if we approve this, we ought to approve it with a different name. Frankly, I mean I know it's part of the parlance of the work that you do, but to our constituents, it it's the plan, and it's really just the beginning of the plan. And I, I, I would like to suggest that or take ideas on an al alternative so that people understand that this is just a step along the way. And when we have the actual plan, we can call that the master plan. Actionable plan. Work plan? How does work plan sound? Everything Action plan? <laughs> Uh -huh. I'm happy with anything. But Mike may have a suggestion. Do you have a thought about that? I'd point out that it's it's actually what what these are called. This this is our capital district master plan from the year 2000, um, and we also have a streetscape master plan. And I've done a number of these types of things. They're always called master plans, and I recognize that's it is kind of you know kind of the lingo, but the the plan that came out you know, you won't be able to see this, was a, a picture of what our downtown would look like with the master plan. And some of the things got built. You know, number three is the transit center. The bike path was supposed to come up and go across the railroad track. It didn't. It went along the river. Does that mean the master plan was bad? No. What was decided in here was we want to have the bike path. And the bike path eventually got built. Didn't get built exactly where it is in, this, in the master plan. But the master plan lays out what we want to see, and then we start working on advancement. We want a transit center. Uh, the parking garage was actually behind the um, positive pie in that Jacob's parking lot. That was where the parking garage was supposed to be. We had actually planned for it eventually in the end to be behind the Becherets. Um, things move, but the idea is a master plan as landscape architects and planners refer to them, are kind of generalized plans that give you the, the momentum of knowing what the public wants so we can start to advance ideas. We don't want to spend time, each step, planning, preparing, implementing, each step costs more. Uh, it might cost you fifty dollars or $100,000 to make this plan. It's going to cost you $500,000 to do your preparation work and millions to build it. If you start doing preparation work to plan for things that eventually you don't do because the public doesn't support, you're, you're spending those $500,000 into advancing things. The idea of doing a master plan. And if you choose to give it a different name, that's perfectly fine too. I'm just pointing out, it is a fairly common term that we have used in the past now for landscape architects and planners. It is what we use, but a name, it's name's a name. Um, if it helps us move this project forward to change the name, we move the project forward and change the name. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Mike, and as uh, as while we're talking about terminology, uh, it's it's what council chamber is what frozen. We called the master plan for the city is not uh, called. Can't the master hear anything plan anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. I think the zoom went out. Okay. I don't know if you all can hear me. Yeah. Same for okay. me, Carrie. Okay.
Yeah, sometimes this computer here. just, the Zoom just crashes for some reason. Carrie Brown, I see you. If, if you hear me, say something. I think that answers that. I've texted them. I assume they're working on it. Uh, yeah. We heard you. Great. Oh. I can hear you now. Okay, great. Seems like we may be back in business. Yeah, thank you. Great. So the last thing which people in Zoom land may or may not have heard was that I, the question I directed to uh, Mike Miller, which is that what for many years we've been used to calling the master plan for the city is now called city plan. It will, when it gets readopted, it'll be the Montpelier city plan. Okay. So again, okay. we terminology. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Any other, um, uh, Mr. Whitaker, would you please have a seat until you're called on? It's, it's, uh, yes, please do that. It's, uh, it's in our standards of conduct and there are people who, find it intimidating when you're standing and looming over them. So please take a seat in one of the chairs. Okay, well, well, farther back then, please. Um, any other questions or comments from mayors, members of the council? Carrie, were you raising your hand? Nope. Okay. Donna. It's just so helpful to have it. And I read some pages in depth and others I skimmed, but it's all there. The charts, all of it, it's just very, very helpful. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I, I agree. I think this is very, very useful and productive. Uh, we'll take uh, comments from the uh, public, starting with the people here in the room. Uh, Steve Whitaker, or, or you were here. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'd like to request a paper copy so that I can read it. I can't study 300 pages in a PDF. Um, I, I would suggest a provisional conceptual plan uh, as a title for this document. It needs to be linked to and consistent with the downtown plan, especially with regards to recreational needs and demands, which should not, you shouldn't have to jump into a car to go get your recreation. Um, but I'm concerned that the due diligence around soils and geology and railroad crossing and second egress, those all are things that could totally rearrange. I think we rushed into three site plans based on none of those constraints and reserved a big chunk of prime ag or whatever used for recreation, I think to cater to a tennis club, you know? And, I just think that's totally inappropriate. And I think many of the counselors said so at the get-go. I think it feels like it's being slipped back in here. But without the railroad being addressed, which I warned before we made the purchase, that that's going to be a problem. And the cost of a secondary road, I, I just feel like we're, we're getting our cart before the horse. That the due diligence related to the actual buildable capacity, subtracting out wetlands, subtracting out prime ag, subtracting out, et cetera, et cetera. We're going we're gonna to lead people to believe that this is what it's going to look like before we know the constraints on the land and the costs. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these pie in the sky concepts on that three charts could, could become unfeasible based on the costs. Um, I'd like to know how much Whitenburg has already been paid and has been contracted for on this because this thing could, we sunk a million dollars in a garage that never got built. And uh, I'm afraid we're gonna sink a million or two into this and it, it may or may not come to fruition. Um, soil, geology, railroad, access roads, and then the housing assessment. 
I think we need to seriously consider and discuss interim emergency housing. Uh, uh, there's very few places that have could accommodate shelters for the hundreds of unhoused people in central Vermont. There is plumbing there. There is restrooms there. I don't know if there's a shower there, but that, that needs to not be, that needs to be front of mind for people who have a conscience. Um, I was, I heard that all this community input was put, but when we talk about community buildings, workshops for people who live, caregivers who are caring for elderly there, I didn't see any of that in the three scenarios planned. It might be in the 300 page report, but um, again, I'll reiterate the relationship to the downtown master plan and what we're gonna do for recreation downtown is a prerequisite to committing you know, a significant chunk of that land for recreation other than cross country skiing or you know, something like that. So I, I think you're, you, sh you should be wisely to the folks who have development experience and say, this is, this is not cooked and we should not be calling it or leading anyone to believe it's a master plan. Thank you. My name's Lisa Burns. I'm in district one. Um, my one concern about all this is the, the tier one, tier two, tier three, um, it, it does um, kind of echo what the previous speaker said, is that to have the housing needs assessment as tier three seems uh, absolutely backwards, especially at this time. And that also in light of the fact that most community members, when this process initially went out, put housing um, as the top above recreation and above anything else, housing was what the community said they wanted out there. And to have it as a tier three thing after already they've done the, the TIF districts and all of this other stuff really seems backwards. And it seems just totally um, out of touch with the crisis that's happening right now to, to put recreation above housing of, of any type and especially affordable housing. That was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, Kim Ward. I live in Montpelier. <laughs> um, I would echo the first, last two people in that the housing feels like it really needs. I'm like, where else? There's so many places in town that I can recreate. I don't get what the issue is when nobody has a house. There are so many people without roofs over their heads. But I also noted in the plan that I didn't see a single version of like studio apartments or co-housing where that there might be an ability to house more people on less land with maybe like common um, common kitchens or something when in the whole state is just so tight for housing. There's plenty of places to my opinion as a citizen that people can recreate without adding. That's Okay, thank you. Anyone else in the room would like to make a comment or raise a question? And I've keep, been keeping an eye on the uh, participants, uh, the re remote participants. I'm not seeing anyone um, raising their hand. Oh, uh, Rick Brock. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thanks. I, a very small footnote, uh, both Mr. Fitzpatrick and Mr. Whitaker have you hold on? Excuse me. Su suggested that the railroad crossing is a problem, but Mr. Mark, I think that railroad crossing is a siding. I, I don't think there's much traffic on that. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Anybody else online whom I'm not seeing? I don't think so. All right, so council, um, what's your pleasure at this point? It's my question or pleasure at this point is to try to figure out what our role will be as we move ahead with this and, and how it works. We've listened to a lot of people, taken a lot of testimony, and we really haven't discussed this as a group. I mean, I really have no sense of how any of you feel about this project or details about it. 
other than the really big big picture look that we've got now. But I think there we should. This is a point where we should get into the details a little bit and start talking about just the concepts because um, we haven't. You know, I, I've tried to lay out a few of my thoughts to give you a sense of like. I'd like to see more phases. So if we bring in development partners, we can bring them in incrementally. It may be one partner, but it may be several. And within those, we could define types of housings we'd like to see in each phase. Um, it's the, the plan, this actionable plan that we're talking about has a lot of road and it gets pretty expansive as it goes up into the other phases. We haven't talked about it. To me, I, I'd much rather see something that's more dense, more down toward the lower end. And in and, and phases rather than spreading it out, I think the more we build all that road and all that asphalt and all the utilities that go with it, um, it really flies in the face of having any chance to create affordable housing because we're sticking so much money in the ground. So I think, you know, those kind of conversations we just haven't had. And I'm wondering when and if that's going to happen. Um, some of those, but it wasn't since you've been on council, Tim. Well, I guess uh, maybe Mike will correct me, but even when you talked, I still get the feeling, and my sense is this actionable plan, I would support that we approve it tonight yeah. and that we use it to have the discussions you're talking about because each of these pieces have to be talked about in depth mm -hmm. as we get more information. Okay. And so, you know, when we talk about a plan, it's not a plan that's in concrete. It's a plan to say a structure to move and discuss ideas in, a, in an orderly fashion, in a meaningful fashion. So I, I see where you're coming from, but I think it comes. We're not guiding it, Donna. We're not, you know, we're just listening. And I think we need to, yeah. it's our turn to give back here a little bit and try to help guide this. Yes. And I think us and the staff, as Mike says, we decide this is what we're going to do. He comes back and says, well, if you want to do this, this is what it'll take in zoning. Yeah. And other staff will come the same way, whether it's the roads or the utilities. Mm -hmm. I think we hear from people and then we have these kind of discussions. That's what I see. But um, so Carrie, I'm hoping for uh, Carrie, you have your hand up. Yes, thanks. Um, uh, so I share Tim's concern. I, I think it's I've been feeling this a little bit myself that we're not exactly guiding this. We're really just kind of saying, okay, as things come in front of us and I'm okay with this, with this master plan um, because it really is sort of like a plan to do more planning. And I think that the kind of the, the pieces that have been laid out make a lot of sense, but I do think that we need to be a bit more hands-on with this city council does. And so um, I, I would vote to approve this with the idea that we're going to be really engaged with each one of these working groups and processes that are that we're setting in motion so that we can have those conversations about you know do we want to do this in phases i think that's a really interesting idea i would love to see some some somebody lay out you know what it would actually cost and how that might work if we just did a piece at a time or um any other alternatives that I haven't thought of because I don't know about this stuff, but um, I think they're really important to talk about. So that's where, you know, so I, that's where I would come down. I'm in favor of this, but I do want us to have the opportunity to, for more in really engagement with it and rather than just kind of saying yes, okay, to something that comes to us fully formed. Thanks, Carrie. Um, yeah, so. I had thoughts along the same lines. I was wondering if there was a way that uh, the council can participate more frequently in, you know, in what is really a substantial um, planning process. Uh, and I, you know, it just seems like it would be, uh, be to our advantage to keep up with it uh, in a in a sort of day to day, uh, not day to day, but more timely month -month fashion meeting. instead of. Um, every other meeting or every couple of meetings. Um, I, I don't know if we've ever done a project of this scale where we've had council sort of uh, embedded somehow, uh, if, if that's a term we can use. So I think as long as the final round of um, the council trying to define the outcomes and the vision and not have seven people voting on, uh, debating and voting every decision that has to be made. So I think, you know, it's finding how, how 
what that balance is. Um, and, you know, I think we have had several big projects and typically the council is involved more at the front end in, in laying out the plans and those things. And then clearly when big changes come up or, you know, financial decisions, those kinds of things, then we come back to, I think, um, Hopefully, you know, we, we have a council rep should be uh, in on, on the committee, but I would suggest to Tim's point. Yeah, it sounds like it hasn't happened yet. We've got to figure that out. Um, I think to Tim's point, it may just be that, you know, maybe we can schedule a workshop meeting. You know, I'm thinking maybe one of the meetings in July or our August meeting where we right now don't have a lot and just kind of kick around where we want to go and what is it, the different ideas that people want to see. And if there's those kind of, you know, connections and figure out where the council would like to land on that. I think, you know, we, it, it won't be done in 2025 or won't be started in 2025. If, if we're debating every step at every, every meeting, I would just say that. So I think you got to lay down your marker early and then, and then, you know, get updates as it goes. Yeah, I, no, I, I I agree with you. I, I, I'm not saying you're not. That's sort of trying to figure out where the the, the road is, and um, so that would be my suggestion. Uh, and that way, you know, we can have more time devoted, you know, maybe in a roundtable session to ask the kind of you know get more detail. There were questions raised. You know, I, you know, for example, I heard you know concerns about the soils and the wetlands. I you know one of the reasons the site's laid out the way it is is those were those were analyzed and the choice that the eligible building spaces were chosen. So that work has been done. Uh, I don't know if railroad work was done, but we, I, I'm sure it was looked at and we can find out what was done. And I think, you know, we can knock off some of those questions, but I think to a more practical basis, questions about what would phasing look like, what kind, what are the different types of housing? I would also say to the, the folks that um, uh, talked about the priority of housing, you know, just because something is a third tier doesn't necessarily mean it's a third priority. It's just the sequencing of things. So if there's a TIF district, that's going to create a mechanism for funding the housing. So you've got to do that. You can still be thinking about the types of housing that you want to do. And clearly housing was the number one priority. And, and the plan calls for like 290 some odd housing units on the site. Now, those could be changed somehow. Those could be different styles of housing, but absolutely um, you know, the tier of things rolling out isn't necessarily a priority. So I think people just need to understand that. It doesn't mean it's lower priority. It just means this is the order we've got to do it. So, and I don't know, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm the least knowledgeable person of our team. Maybe uh, the consultants or Mike or somebody might want to tell me what I just said wrong. Just one adding, it was, it was great. The one, one addition on the housing needs assessment, the idea is to get that, have that done as close to the issuance of the RFP as possible because housing needs change over time and you don't want to do the housing needs assessment now. And then two years later, you issue the RFP and all of a sudden there's more studio needs for studios and one bedrooms and not as many two bedrooms. So that it, it certainly didn't mean it was less prior of a priority. It was just trying to get as close as possible to that RFP. What do other council members think about the idea of devoting the bulk of our August meeting, say to a, a real discussion of this stuff? At our level, it's sort of as at a policy as a policy guidance level. And Carrie, see you have your hand up. Yes, uh, I am in favor of that. I think it would be it would be really helpful to um, to have some guidance for that discussion, so that we can you know have so we can talk about housing, and then in terms of like what kind of housing and affordable housing, or you know that kind of thing and recreation and you know some some kind of structure to it so that we have a chance to really discuss all of these um in, in an open-ended way but also with some hopeful hopeful be some direction at the end if we, if we set up the august 23rd meeting is tentative workshop a couple of things we can do is make sure that nothing else substantive gets on there um, and the other thing is then that gives us a little time to work through kind of an issues list that we can circulate and get feedback from people and, um, but, you know, to, to structure a conversation and not just have it, just not just wing it. Uh, so we can, you know, spend a couple hours, two or three hours on this with, you know, what do we want to get out of it? What, what's the outcome we're looking for and those kind of things. 
Donna. Motion that we go ahead and accept this actionable plan. Do you want to put a name on name to it? I called it the actionable plan mm -hmm. for now, if that appeases people. Uh-huh. So. Are you leaning forward to second it? I will second that. Okay. I just had a comment. I see Pellin has her hand okay. up. So so why don't go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just want to ask, uh, in that workshop, can we bring all the questions we are receiving uh, from uh, people who live in our district? For example, the last question I received, if there is any plan to create transportation to downtown, if people want to do shopping, if they want to go and do things because it's kind of far away and if people don't have their own car you know questions like that uh, and we can answer all the questions all together in our august meeting is it is it possible i would say not only possible but it would ideally we could get them all in advance we could organize okay. great yeah organize uh topics by the, what people are interested in talking about perfect yeah thank you thank you uh, it looks like you're in the airport, so good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So, I just wanted to clarify that I have no interest in micromanaging the process. What I'm most concerned about is just communication. It, the more frequent communication, the better is the outcome. I, I, my 50-year career in, in housing and trade publishing had to do with remodelers who, who all make the same mistakes. They, they can't estimate. They don't show up on time. They don't finish on time and they don't communicate. They don't, they just don't let you know what's going on until it's all done. And that's a problem. We can't, we can't manage that on a project of this scale. So I just would like to find a ways where the council could at least be informed of progress in a more frequent, more frequent uh, fashion. Totally fair. Um, Lauren. Sorry, trying to get off mute. Um, yeah, I mostly just want to echo, I, I'm really glad that we're going to um, move in this direction. I think it's been hard each meeting to try to have the kind of discussion that it sounds like we're going to set up, um, which I think will be really helpful at just laying out a bunch of these issues and ideas. Um, it's like in the interest of making sure that we're keeping everything moving and taking the actions that um, the staff and consultants wants us each time. It has kind of felt like it's kind of precluded the kind of conversation that we're now queuing up. Um, so just, just echoing my uh, gratitude that we're going to take this. Next step. Great. Any further discussion on the motion? Um, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, we have adopted uh, the actionable plan. Thank you. Um, yes. I'm the reporting our resident. Two, I'm with the hub, but I'm just speaking as a citizen right now. I'm absolutely flabbergasted for lack of a better word uh, to hear that the goal is groundbreaking for housing in roughly two years. I'm glad to hear this, but uh, I must say I'm skeptical. Um, before it's always been, uh, I attended almost all of the public sessions and the estimates have until now always been in the three to five year range. And I've heard several people speculate about it's really likely to be closer to 10 years when there's a groundbreaking. Now, one thing that I did not hear that I expected to hear tonight was an RFP or some sort of process to hire consultants for phase two of this process. You know, phase one is now complete, my understanding. So is it gonna be White and Burke again for phase two? 
what might that look like? Or is there going to be an RFP that goes out for consultants? So those are all actions that need to be taken that are in the list and things that we need to lay out for decisions. So I don't think we're prepared to make those decisions tonight. Not before when? August? Well, maybe. I mean, we were thinking of having it by July. I don't I, we didn't know if the council was going to approve this tonight. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, our discussions we've been having is that uh, as staff, we we're going to be sitting down in July once we had this definitively closed and the project planning step over. We could start laying out and that walking back. All right, we're going to put the stake in the ground. This is where we'd like to be able to break ground and work our way back. Um, we had conversations uh, earlier or li late last year. Um, that maybe we could be breaking ground in 2024. Um, and again, that's, but the reality is, is probably going to take longer with the number of, of hurdles that are still sitting out there. Um, and I have heard people say, uh, you know, three to five years or longer than that. Um, and a lot of that, I mean, frankly, it's just, it's, it happens when you don't have good organization and good process about working through public process that it projects it that's what takes longer and um you know i have some experience doing this i have some experience getting these things moving and keeping them on track and we'll see how this one progresses um and see if any barriers come up um it's all going to be depending on what what gets thrown in front of us you know um as we saw with parking garage it takes one lawsuit and and there's nothing any of us can do about do about that so um but yeah um regarding phase two contracts um we're going to be sitting down to have that conversation of what it's going to take phase one was it was done under the umbrella of white and burke but we actually signed three separate contracts we expect phase two is going to probably be be very similar we're going to be signing separate contracts um and we're going to decide we need more engineering work on the roads and we're going to have a conversation with you do you guys want us to invite um, VHB to continue as our engineer for the roads and utilities. They are not doing the housing. They're looking at the roads and utilities and those types of features. Will we bring on White and Burke for phase two? It's an open question. Um, you know, they're the experts in TIF. We're going to need TIF, but there are lots of these questions. And these are the questions we're going to have to be bringing back to you guys. And as we said, we're going to be pulling them together and August will probably be a big opportunity for us to go and lay out a bunch of these to say, all right, we have a number of these decisions. What's the path we want to take to get us to that next, next step. Thanks, Mike. Okay. It's uh, 8, 17 PM. It is time. I think this is a good time to take our 10 minute break and we'll reconvene in, at 827. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, just two minutes past our time. It is, uh, we're now up to item number nine, uh, outside agency funding. And I assume the manager will be kicking that off. Yeah. Um, you know, I sent you a pretty extensive article, uh, paper about the history of how we got to be where we are. Uh, and I think the reason this is on the agenda tonight, you already approved the grants that the community fund recommended. So that's an important piece of business. But last winter, when we were doing the budget, there was discussion about how we do this process and how, you know, things get on the ballot and how did we get to where we are now? And the council at that time said, uh, so and, and we had basically just taken the prior year's approved budget number, put it in the budget uh, and allowed the two agencies to go onto the ballot, uh, even though they had increases because of COVID. And I think there was a sort of, uh, well, what's the rationale behind this? So we, we said collectively that we wanted to talk about it again during the summer or some point when we didn't have budget decisions facing us. And it seemed like it made sense to do it the same night that we approved the, the funding. So um, I've outlined for you the history of how we got to be where we are. I'm happy to answer any questions about that and um, give you a list of my thoughts on it. But really, there's what, what you think is um, what matters. 
Okay, anybody um, on council have any comments, any thoughts to start out with? Obviously the easy thing would be to just say, well, it's working, we'll do, keep doing the, what we've been doing, um, but I don't wanna foreclose discussion that, uh, that anyone might wanna have. Okay, I'm not hearing. It seems like it's Go ahead, kind of, Jim, yeah. sorry, Jack. Thank you. It seems like the kind of issue that more experienced counselors who have been through this cycle would have better feedback. Mm -hmm. I've only really watched it from the outside, so it, it and tried to understand it. Well, I'm not a council member, but I have certainly watched it. And uh, as you can see from the memo, there were a lot of different uh, iterations of this, and uh, we spent a, a lot of time in this room talking about this issue about what the right or wrong thing to do. So I just offer, you know, my advice um, is in the memo, but I'll say it out loud is, I think the community fund generally works really well. We have had a really hard working group of individuals that spend time going through these applications. I think the amount of money that goes into the community fund, that is a a process that hasn't been as well defined. Uh, some years we've just stuck it as the prior year. Other, you know, back when they made their recommendations in January, sometimes they'd come in, we'd be toward the end of the budget process, and they'd say, "Well, we've, you know, we'd like another twelve thousand to fund everybody we recommend." And the council would say, "Okay," and you know, and then that kind of messed up, or not messed up, but they just changed the numbers we were working with for the overall budget. And so I think some clarity about how we reach the amount of money that goes in. And I think the simple, the, the only way that can really work because you can't predict way in advance what it's going to be, it would be to actually ask that group to make a budget recommendation or, or request at the same time, everyone else makes a budget request. And then that can be viewed, you know, they can give their reasons. We had, you know, $270,000 worth of applications this year. We only had $134,000 to award. Looking at our history, maybe 170 would be, a, you know, they could give their rationale and the council can then make their decisions as part of the whole budget process. So that's, that's one part of it. I do think that um, is we ought to split out the $10,000 arts fund and kind of, it got pushed in when this was created. And I don't think it's never, ever really been a great fit. I think the community funds worked really hard at trying to make sure they fund arts things, but, you know, giving them a set number of this is for arts, this is for community services, and then decide whether it's that group that does it or the public arts commission, or go back to the system. I used to run a group that did it. I don't really care, but just be clear that these are separate pots of money for different pur purposes. And then I think the, so, and then I think the last question is really the one that we get faced with. It's interesting how much airtime it takes, but is about these items that go on the ballot, the library. And at this point, it's really CVHHH, you know, who, who I mean, the lie. So the, the longstanding library policy was if you're asking, you know, we'll put you on the ballot if you're asking for the same amount. If you want more, you petition to go. And essentially that became the policy for Central Vermont home health they, they asked you know because they petitioned they didn't use the the community fund and last three years because of covid they've asked not to petition for health reasons understand and i think the main decisions we have to make whatever we make is if we make a decision now or by august or something that the rules are clear for all the players going well in advance so you don't I mean, you still may find someone pleading a case in here, but at least, you know, we can say we gave you a lot of notice about what what the needs are going to be. So uh, those are my thoughts on this. Okay. Uh, the committee does such thorough work. I mean, and that was one of the things is that we wanted to have a hands-on approach to what the organization was actually doing. But when I looked down the list, there were over, there were 10 that, asked for over $10,000. And to me, those groups should have to do a petition. I, I don't think this, they should be part of the community fund. The community maybe, fund maybe, is, maybe I mean, I know that's what I'm proposing to, for the council just to think about. We don't have to decide tonight, but I do think these larger groups in the library and home 
home, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice is a similar, but there are others here that are some that we would probably support, like Just Basics or the Teen Center. I mean, like that's ours or not. Um, I don't think it's a matter of the community fund to decide. That's all. Thanks, uh, Carrie. Yeah, um, Bill, would you mind talking a little bit more about your proposal to separate out the arts funding? I know that it used to be separate um, and it's been combined and what's what's the rationale for that? Um, I think the rationale is only that um, you're sort of creating a situation where people are applying for one, for, you know, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges in the same pot of money. It could certainly, it could still be done by the same board. I think just being clear that we're setting 10 for arts and everything else for community services. I, I'm less, I could care less really who then makes those decisions. It was more because at some point you're asking the same board that who's looking at $270,000 worth of applications to decide whether an affordable housing project or a shelter project is more than a public, you know, more important than a public arts project. And so if we think funding public art is important, then we should just separate it out and call it that and say that's how much goes to that and everything else goes to something else. That's my thinking. Um, and I actually argued that at the time the community fund was made, but the council decided to put them together at the time. I mean, it's not the end of the world if we don't do it. They've been doing it that way since 20. 16 or something, but I just think it's clean. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of value to the way we've been doing it. And I know in the, in the fall or when we were doing the budget, I was saying, well, geez, this was done as a way to take it away for, take these decisions out of the political or out of the democratic process. And I think of it, and I think that was not really the best way to, to phrase it because I think that, it's not it's not feasible. The city council doesn't have the time to go through a list like this and make decide every five hundred and ten or or thousand dollar expenditure for all of these uh, organizations, many of which are uh, are certainly worthy of support and and i I do appreciate the the work and the scrutiny that the uh, community fund board uh, gives this um and by the same token i i don't i remember when there would be 20 or 30 different tiny items on the on the ballot and uh for one thing they virtually all passed anyway and for another thing i don't think the voters liked having the opportunity or having to go through 20 or 30 different 500 or thousand dollar appropriations. And so I think that I do think that uh, what you suggested bill is a way to keep what's, what's good about what we're doing now and uh, treat some of the bigger items uh, with the attention they deserve. Don is one that proposed. So I, I was just wanted to deal with the two that have been habitual ballot uh, conundrums. But so, sir, twenty thousand, right. seventeen thousand five hundred, twenty one thousand, thirteen thousand. I mean, those are large requests that, to me, don't belong in this small pot of money. So, um, we're probably not at the point to say. Here's our policy, and we're going to vote on it. <clears throat> but uh, could we get? Could I get a sense from the council on whether whether you think this is move, uh, Bill's suggestion is moving in the right direction? Nods, uh, thumbs up. Sal. Well, not not really having had uh, any experience with it. Um, certainly, the the board sounds like a good approach i mean i you know I, I, a long list of things on the ballot um you know people have no way of evaluating any of that stuff and to put it in the hands of a responsible uh citizenry right people are volunteer for this work mm -hmm. um i'm sure they do a conscientious job 
Um, it, it, I think it just makes sense. Um, I imagine that the library is almost always successful oh, yeah. in getting their petitions and in getting their, their increase passed, right? So maybe, you know, maybe we just put them on the ballot. I mean, I'm really, I'm really telling you what has happened in the past. In fact, for a long time, if you, if you go through the history, there was a period of time when the library was in the city budget. Then there was a period of time when the prior year's library was in the city budget, but the increase was on the ballot. And then the next year, the, and, and then at some point, the library budget got so big, and I think the city council, and I, I kind of agree with that, said, you know what? It's not a city library. It's, you know, it's a public library. It's really just between the voters and them. It's really, you know, let, we're not. And so the council just said, we're going to put their entire budget on the ballot. And the only con attempt at budget control that they exercised was, we'll make it easy for you if you don't increase it. You can just put it on. If you, if you want to go up, then you've got a petition. Um, but that was a, that was a choice. And that's the same as Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. I and mean, then certainly a little different than, you know, the 450 or 500,000 that the library is. I mean, they're, you know, I think you, you could split those two and consider them in different categories, particularly if Donna's idea of everything above a certain amount has to be petitioned, um, you know, then that captures CVHHS for that matter, may capture the library too. I don't know, but the, I mean, I think you, I don't Opinion is that you'd be within your rights to sort of have one set thing for the library. It is the, our public library, even though it's in the city, I mean, versus other agencies. I don't think that they necessarily have to be grouped, but often they have been in this conversation. Um, and, you know, as far as your suggestion, Donna, maybe we should ask feedback from the board, what they think about that, you know, and get... Mm -hmm. The, the other piece when uh, I was early on the council and this had just started being formed and this push to have everybody accountable to how many Montpelierites they served, when the library last gave us their numbers, our percentage of money totally outweighed our percentage of users. So yes, it is our library, <laughs> but their actual users <laughs> are more non Montpelierites and Montpelierites. So it's just hard for me to have that standard when somebody comes for 5,000 or 500 versus this huge library. <laughs> yeah, that's all. I think consistency is a really valuable thing when you're dealing with this kind of process. And it feels like you've been very consistent for a decade. And that's good. Um, so maybe if it needs to be tweaked a little, but it generally sounds like it's working. Uh, Carrie. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. It, I, I think it is it is working. I, I think that the suggestions um, that Bill has made the one is to keep the community fund process in place. I think that's a good idea. Reaffirm the current award schedule. I think that's a good idea. Clarify how the budget funding is established. Um, inviting the board to request an appropriation in November with other budget requests. That makes a lot of sense. I think we should do that. Um, and as far as clear policy about the library and the CV, the home health and hospice, um, you know, they're, I think that they are two different things, and the the library feels to me more like I want to I want to be able to um, be sure that we're going to provide funding to the library um, because it is a public library. Home health and hospice feels a little bit different. Um, I don't feel a great need to change the policy that was in place. I would probably approve if we did change that, but doesn't feel urgent. Um, but I don't, you know, I wasn't in favor of of giving them the exception to the um, petitioning last time around. So I agree with consistency. We've got to make everybody follow the same procedures. But the, the question for me is about the, um, the arts funding. Um, I think Bill has a point that they're sort of, you know, arts compared to housing. It, maybe housing is always going to win out, but I don't. 
But I think, so I think the question for us is, do we want to guarantee that there's a certain amount of money available for arts? Yes or no. And then if so, then how do we make sure that happens? And that's a question that I don't have a clear answer for yet. And I think needs a little bit more discussion. That is 100% a policy question for sure. Yeah. Yep. So where are we? Um, so, uh, you, do you feel okay with suggesting to Bill that you take he take the feedback that he's gotten, talk to the board and maybe the Public Arts Commission too to see because I don't think the Public Arts Commission existed at the time. No, they did not. This was created. So that's another. So, yeah, it would seem to me that if, at least based on what I'm hearing, what I think I'm hearing is that the, the, the real decisions left are amount or, or presence of arts funding. And then once that's decided, then how that gets fu funded, those are, you know, if you don't set aside arts funding, then doesn't matter how it gets funded. Um, and then the second is, is the, the outs, the petition versus, you know, library and everything else. So, I mean, it sounds like everything else is okay. So maybe what we can do is, uh, and then the, the idea of maybe asking the larger ones to petition. So maybe we could put those questions on the next agenda, just narrow it down to those and get input from the, all of the next, well, Either the next agenda or the July 20th, I'm just because of the holiday week and everything, but see if we, whenever we can get enough feedback, one of the July agendas and, um, and then just walk through those decisions and the council can make your decisions and then we can communicate to everybody what it's going to be. So didn't we hear from the public arts? So the public arts commission, yes, we did hear from them and they, so they do exist now. They didn't exist, um, yeah, and as I recall, they they do a remarkable job yes. of leveraging the, they do. the funds. So they this this ten thousand is specifically for small arts grants to the community. It's not it's not for us to do arts projects. It's for people to apply, whether it's for a public art piece or a performance or those kinds of things. And you typically, I think, limited to a thousand or maybe twelve hundred dollars. They're not they're not big grants, and they're just meant to kind of have some public art in the community. Now it was 10,000, you know, 20 years ago when we started and it's still 10,000. So that's another question. But so before the community found, there was actually a committee of, uh, it was me, uh, folks from Lost Nation Theater, if Onion River Arts Council, if anybody remembers those, My Player Live, and I think the curator from the, the city hall, because those people all got money elsewhere. And so they couldn't, they were prohibited from applying for it. So we would do it and make the recommendations and award and it worked pretty well. And then when the community fund was created, the council said, let's put that in. And I, like I said, I said, don't do that. That's a separate thing. They're not, but they did. And so that's what's happened. So since then, the um, community fund board has been making, you know, people, arts people still apply to that and they get some funding from it. And I, I just don't think there's a hard line that says this much goes to art. I think they just try to balance it. And so that's that's kind of the history. So then, so A, should we fund arts grants that way? How much should we fund it? And then last question is who who manages it? And so, Carrie. Um, so to clarify, the, the Public Arts Commission has a budget that's separate from this. Okay, so we're putting money towards arts. Yep. And maybe if we, if we want the pub, if we want there to be money available for individual grants to artists, the Public Arts Commission might be a better vehicle for that. I mean, people could still apply to the Community Fund Board if they want, but if we want to make sure that there's arts funded, we already have a, you know, maybe that's the way to to direct that. And Donna, you have a thought about that. Now, individuals are going to the Public Art Commission because the Public Art is. Oh things outside uh, that get shared by the public. Whereas what the Montpelier Fund is the city capital fan, city concerts, arts for uh, center for arts and learning. I'm reading them down here. There's a music group. There's a, the summit school, traditional music and culture, 
there's a wood art gallery, there's a fiddler orchestra, and the Philharmonic. So it's, they're very different than public art, I think. And I don't yeah, see and our I public arts commission as being heavy on a, wanting more administration. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you for that clarification, because I was under the impression that people were individual artists were applying to the community fund board to further their own work. Um, More about performance and those kind of things. Oh, okay, and it sounds like they are being funded. Yeah. I think, Great. Uh, my only recommendation was to say, if we're going to do it, let's make give, give them and, you know, just separate a number this much is for art so that they don't have to make the decision distinction between... Or not. Or maybe just leave it as is. That's also fine. Nope. I'm not dying on this hill. Okay. Well, that's, that'll be part of the discussion next time. Is that okay, Carrie? Or do you want to? No, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I think we're set on that then. Thank you. Next up, district heat budget and rates. Turn this one over to Sarah LaCroix. And that's why you're here until, well, it's almost only nine, but <laughs> could have been much later. Night away from the kids. Sorry. Um, hi, I'm Sarah LaCroix, the finance director, um, and this is going to be a pretty brief presentation on district heat, its budget, and its rates um, for fiscal year 2024. Am I not, is it not shared? Okay, so this is the fiscal year 2024 district heat budget and rate presentation. Um, this first slide basically outlines the customer agreement, Article 6 and Article 7 within the signed customer agreements defines what's included in the capacity related charges and the energy related charges. Um, it also provides a timeline that we're required to provide an estimate of the cost to run the utility to customers, which is by June 15th each year. And the rates are supposed to be set by June 30th each year. Um, Article 6 defines capacity as costs other than energy, which these costs are the operating costs, admin, legal, debt, working capital, and capital replacement and improvement, where Article 7 defines energy-related costs as the customer's thermal energy use from the heating system based on heat the customer's building. Um, this is based on metered flow. The energy related charges are from the state of Vermont and the city for consumption of fuels, including but not limited to wood chips, oil, natural gas, and purchase of thermal energy. Um, and just to touch back on the capacity charge, this is allocated to each of the 17 customers based on their maximum thermal energy demand during any 15 minute period throughout the seven month heating season. Um, this next slide is the annual debt service for district heat. It's made up of four different loans for fiscal year 2023, 
the debt made payments totaled 190,000. It's estimated that for 2024, the debt payments will be approximately $187,000. This slide is a presentation of the audited district heat financials. It, it recaps the income statement. Um, for each year, the district heat has been in operation. This utility operates at a loss annually. Um, at the end of FY22, the loss for that fiscal year was $150,675. FY23 is not yet available because the year is not completed, nor is the audit. So you know, we just don't have accurate numbers to provide at this point, um, but we would anticipate that it will also end in a loss consistent with prior years. Uh, the main reason that this fund operates at a loss is due to the city's budgeting for debt service instead of for depreciation. Debt service, as I mentioned before, is $187,000, where you can see here depreciation is $325,000. So, we're doing this in order to keep the, the utility affordable to the users. Best practice would be to budget for the higher of the two, which would help you build a reserve and keep the fund from operating at a loss. But at this point, that's not something that would be um, reasonable to do for the end users, um, but a reserve would help for future replacement costs. Um, this slide is just um, a representation of the budget and its breakdown, um, as well its history. The FY24 budget that was originally proposed, which was using our estimate of what we thought state charges would increase to, was $734,445. After review of the state's fixed income or fixed and energy charges that we received in early June, we were able to reduce the budget to $689,589. This is actually $31 less than the FY23 budget. Um, what this means is that um, for capacity and energy rates based on the proposed budget, 482,867 of that is related to capacity, which will require a $6.90 per MMBTU rate, which is an increase of five cents over the prior year. Um, the energy rate we would need to cover the difference um, from that in the total budget of 206,722 is $15.65 per MMBTU. Um, and as I mentioned before, these states are reflective of the state's projected operational costs, as well as the evergreen capacity study that we had performed for the FY23 usage. This slide um, is a spreadsheet and it um, basically it shows the capacity and MMBTUs for um, FY23 and FY24 as it's allocated to the customers, and then how that is a, relates as a monthly cost for both FY23 and 24. So I just wanted to show the comparison and um, how the deck shuffles based on peak capacity um, that's allocated to each customer. So Basically, to wrap this up, my recommended action for you is to approve the district heat budget in the amount of $689,589 and, and establish district heat capacity rate at $6.90 and energy rate at $15.65 for fiscal year 2024. Thanks, Sarah. Do we have any questions from uh, council members? Tim. Just because I'm the, the first line on the list here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so we're doing $150,000 a year loss for this. In, in terms of the debt service, is there a point at which you see where it will catch up and be okay? Or do we just need to add more accounts and get more people involved to make sense of this? Yeah, so um, really what we need is to add users to this. Um, and we are pursuing new customers. Um, and we are talking about a snow melt system, which would um, take a share of the capacity costs. But until we can add more users, we can't budget for more expenses or else the share just increases the cost of the current users on the system. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, you know, Sarah is, is giving the absolute accurate information that from an accounting perspective, it's operating as a loss. From a cash perspective, it's basically breaking even because we're we're not spending 325000 in depreciation. We're only spending the debt. So I just want to be clear that we're not actually losing cash every year. We're 
you know, we, we are not, we should be budgeting this depreciation. So it's, it's a fair accurate, but I do, I do want to just, for those that are this, you know, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's fine. Yeah, no, that was, that was the most important question she got in her interview. So don't really understand the evergreen report. So, so could you sum up their recommendations? Yep. So Evergreen Energy is the, the consulting arm of the St. Paul District Heat System. And as you know, they were our main consultant on designing the system and the engineers that really oversaw the, the project and helped us put together the operating costs. So um, because they have an expertise that we don't have, um, two or three years ago. So, so one of the things that we were supposed to have done after three years was to do an annual re I call it reappraisal, but updating of everyone's energy use. And for whatever reason that didn't get done. So we finally did it like six or seven years in and it changed everyone's rates. And you can, you know, just like a reappraisal, you can imagine how that went. They were winners and losers. And um, you know, so I think there was a question about the, our methodology. And in, so to increase confidence from the users, we said, you know what, let's go get the experts. So we contracted with Evergreen to do the, the capacity study of how, how it's calculated according to the contract and to give us recommendations for the, the allocation of the funding. And as it turned out, it was pretty close to what we had come up with on our own, but you know, it was important to get the validity. So what we promised our customers um, was that we would have Evergreen do this for at least three straight years. So this is the third year of that. And, um, and I think just because to, to the good, you know, one of the, the, one of the pluses that it has created is customers have some customers have really aggressively looked at how they're, how they can manage their capacity. Um, and so they've dropped their rates, but of course, because it's a, it's kind of a zero sum game. That means, you know, what they're losing gets spread out to other people. So, um, but ideally everyone will calibrate. Anyway, long story short, we, we've agreed to have a evergreen come back one more time just because people, because the cap capacities are, are dynamic. The, the plus side for the city is for those that have been around a while. When we first started the system, you may remember, we were pretty close to our total system capacity. And we were talking about having to buy more from the state and all this stuff. The, the cumulative effort of customers to reduce their capacity has now brought us down. We're only at about 50% of our total capacity. So our ability to expand a new customers is not really an issue now. We don't have to assume those additional costs. So, um, so I think, you know, by having the proper data, people are making good decisions to manage their own systems. Uh, and so that, you know, ultimately we, we're hoping everyone will kind of get to an optimal amount. It won't necessarily save the money, but it will be the, the proper distribution of the actual demands on the system. And then it will get really stable and people can count on that. And then as we add users, that will just drop everyone's rate. Uh, and we do have three or four potential users and, and then the snow melt, um, which is our own, which we need for several reasons for the city, uh, including uh, the side benefit of we would help the district heat system. But it's, uh, as, as people may know, we, we don't have a lot of options to dump snow anymore when we clean snow. And so we either run it out to the stump dump or we run it out to under the interstate, but we can only do that during the day because the noise bothers people across the river. And, it's, you know, we used to have 10 snow dumps when I started, you know, we have two and it's very inefficient. You have to fill trucks, they drive out to homes, you know. And so having a downtown location where we can dump snow, not only would make our snow removal more efficient, but it would mean it was going into the drainage system, which means it's going to the treatment plant and being treated. So the salts and all the crap that's in it would actually be better environmentally as well. In addition to being melted with wood chip heat and financially benefiting all the other customers because the city would actually be taking on, it's going to be a high capacity user. So it, it you know, we'll be helping other customers while also doing a good thing for ourselves. So, um, and we're, we're looking at various locations, including um, potentially partnering with the state because they clear their parking lots too. So it might be somewhere in a state parking lot and we can both use it and 
No, that would be, you know, and then there are, like I said, a couple, one big user, a few smaller users. The East State expansion, there are three or three, I think, potential new customers um, that once we've got this road dug up, we can connect them. a uh, couple of your neighbors. Yeah, oh, and, just the people right behind you. And has it, our, uh, our barbers. would it be a good deal for, for a building owner to come on the system and get their heat this way instead of of fuel oil or whatever. So that's been the struggle is, be, you know, I think we're, when, when we, when we put the system in, heat was, fuel was like 365, 375 a gallon, and then it dropped to about 175. Uh, and so wasn't a good deal, quite frankly. Um, I think it's getting more competitive and the more users we can, um, the more users we can put on, the lower that cost will be and the, the closer to oil it will be. And it does have the benefit of being a lot more stable without the spikes that oil has. And, you know, everyone's making their own decisions, but uh, it, I think, you know, it has the potential of reducing or eliminating the cost of replacing furnaces every so often, those kinds of things, because you don't know. Some people have chosen to keep their furnaces as a backup. Others have just taken them out. So I think there's, other benefits, but you know, it, it right now it is a little more expensive than just calling it like it is. But um, with these users, we think we can get it back. I mean, we never, I don't think we're ever going to match a dollar 75, but at a more reasonable oil price, um, we, we can be competitive. Okay. Anybody else? And I'm not seeing. Anyone on screen? Um, it it looks like we may have dropped to both uh, Councillor Cohn and Hurl. Uh, Lauren texted me. Still on. Yeah, Carrie's still on. Um, uh, Lauren texted me to say that she was just about out of power on her phone, so we, we probably lost her. Um, so. And Helen's flight might have gotten called. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope she can be on the plane on the way back. Uh, yes. Yes. I'll and the budget. Motion. The budget and the rates. Yeah. The budget and the rates. Thank you. That's what I was looking for, exact word. Mm -hmm. Budgets and the rates. Yes. <laughs> so, I just don't have it up here, so I can't read it. And is there a second? So, Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. We have adopted the budget and rates for the district heat system. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. This is very good. I, I give hats off to Sarah. This is a pretty complicated thing, and she came in in the middle of it and has really uh, put a lot of sweat into this to understand it and now speaks as intelligently as any of us about it. So uh, good work on her part. Okay, let's move to council reports. Start at Tim's end this time. Nothing. Sal? Just that uh, the Energy Committee, of course, is engaged in uh, trying to help attract new customers, and they're, they're looking at some things that help to reduce the, uh, you know, the initial setup costs, that sort of thing. So, uh, and as well as the you know, keeping an eye on the melt, the melt project, which has some good potential. So uh, this situation may get may get better. <laughs> With the melting project, if if we were to get the state in on this, would would we charge them to dump it on their our land so that uh, because they would be using our uh, heat to do it? Possibly, I think we. It also might be one of those things that if it's on their land. Maybe they allow them, you know, we'd have to work that out, mm -hmm. how that would work. Or maybe there would be a way to figure out who's dumping what and who's paying what share of it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't think we've gotten that far yet. It's, it's really been, hey, we think we need this. We were actually looking at it in the parking lot out back here. I thought. And there's some technical concerns with that. The, the line that runs through to the police station may not be big enough to handle the capacity needed. So... 
uh, we started looking for other locations and said, well, hey, maybe maybe the state would be a good partner on this because we have it's downtown and we have common needs. So it's really just been a, would you like to talk about it? Yes, let's talk about it. Gotcha. This is about as far as we've gotten. So I don't know what okay. that end decision would be. Cool. Um, Carrie. Yes, I am on the public restroom committee and um, I just wanted to report on what's going on there. Um, so we've been talking about how to, uh, how to uh, uh, meet the immediate need for public restrooms and how, and uh, kind of following the principles of let's try to serve as many people as possible and use what we have as much as we can. And so we, we asked the staff representative who was with us to look at what it would take to keep the city hall restrooms open on kind of a trial basis just during the day on weekends. So they're already open during the day and in the week. They're often open in the evenings if Lost Nation is here or if there's a meeting or something like that. Um, so let's just see what does it take to just have them open during the day on Saturday and Sunday and to try to, um, we, we got, we were given a budget, um, of $180,000 that it would take to keep the, uh, to keep them open 24 hours a day, all, all week long. And that was assuming a, a full-time attendant on site at all times, other than during the the biz, during business hours, <clears throat> we thought that seemed possibly excessive, and maybe there were things we could do rather than have somebody actually, you know, sitting outside the bathroom twenty four hours a day. Something that might serve as deterrence to vandalism, which is a, a from what we understand from the city is the primary concern. Um, so we talked about additional surveillance cameras we talked about asking the police and the fire department to just kind of swing by and check in we talked about signage indicating that there is surveillance and that police and fire and city you know city people were coming in um and to think about other ways to kind of try to deter any sort of problematic behavior and then just uh, see how it goes um and uh, so we're hoping to hear back from staff about what that would take. Um, we also talked about looking into alternatives, like, you know, we've got the Portland Blue kind of on our radar or trailers or something like that, all of which might be expensive or might, we don't know yet. We're gathering information about that. But um, we kind of have this priority of, getting something in place as fast as we can. And, and we've got porta potties, which is good for now. We did hear that there is a plan to keep at least one set up over the winter, probably behind the rec center, um, which is great since they can't stay behind city hall or behind the senior center, which is where they are now. They can't stay there because that's where snow gets dumped. So we could at least have a poor potty, but that doesn't allow a place for someone to wash their hands. And, you know, obviously they're sort of gross. So it's not a great solution, but it is something. It is something that's available. Um, we also have, I think we, you might've heard about this already, but there's a, a list and a map of all of the restrooms in town that we know of that are currently public, publicly accessible. And Montpelier Live has printed that out in brochure form and it's being distributed to um, like at the, the transit center and the, the tourist center for the state and city hall. And um, hopefully it's gonna get into the hands of outreach workers who are working for Good Samaritan so that um, unhoused people can know where they are as well as um, I think we're gonna have them all on Google Maps pretty soon so people can just search on their phones to find a public restroom. So there, so there, there are things happening in the public restrooms in Montpelier realm, just to reassure everybody about that. And more will be happening soon. That's right. it, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, we just had a recent Regional Planning Commission Transportation Advisory Group. And those of you who are new to the council may not be as familiar with the complete streets policy that the council adopted in the public safety 
uh, I'm sorry, Department of Public Works follows when they're dealing with roads and sidewalks and bike paths, et cetera. And there was a big discussion that those policies are there, but that we all need to be much more aware of, of making sure we follow them every incident we have, including when we're doing projects with the state. Among the TAC, all these towns, we had like 20 in attendance uh, last evening, and they all were concerned that maybe the state was not doing its share on state projects like Route 2. When they come through State Street, I look mm. at the bike paths there on both sides of the roadway, and they seem smaller than they were before they repaved. And that concerns me. So I don't know exactly how we, we uh, get more pushy about it, but I think we really need to when we have these projects with the state that not only for ourselves, but that the state needs to be held to a higher standard to actually implement and not just have the words of complete streets in your mind. Um, so that's a, a to-do, sort of. The parks have been really busy adding more trails on all this wonderful newly acquired land the last couple of years. And the one thing they've come up against, so I'm begging the public and all of us to stay on the paths <laughs> that public go into a woods and they decide, I'm going to take a shortcut. Well, that damages wildlife, plants, and gets us into trouble. So please stay on the trails. Stay on the trails. And I want to say, I'm sorry, I do not remember Stephanie's last name from White and Burke. Clark. Clark. But I just really want to salute that she did an outstanding job dealing with the public constantly. I just feel we were so very fortunate to have her on this phase one project and whether we could send her not only a congratulations to mother and baby, but a big, big thank you. She did an excellent job. I'll be happy to share that. I, I think that's totally up uh, since it's time up, uh, time up. I think that's totally right. I think we've all developed not just a an incredible amount of respect for her work, but a great personal fondness for her and for everything she's done for us. So, so that's great. Um, mayor's report, a uh, couple of things. One, uh, I did take the time to look at the uh, ordinances and um, we already have an ordinance that says that uh, bicycles are not allowed to be uh, operated on uh, sidewalks in the downtown area. And I assume, I, I don't know if there's a definition of bicycle in the ordinances, but I assume that uh, that applies to electric bicycles too. Um, it does seem like uh, enforcement is a good idea. Um, the other thing is July 3rd is coming up uh, on Monday um, <clears throat> and get out there, enjoy the community. I think it's not gonna be raining all day. <laughs> Can't promise good weather, but get out there to the parade and to the uh, events downtown. And that's all I've got, city clerk. Oh, but there's something you told me to remind you of. Oh my God. Oh, yes. Just wanted to note the passing of Catherine Simpson, um, who was a longtime justice of the peace and, uh, you know, an active person in the community. I only heard about this very recently. And, um, you know, the process will begin to, you know, replace her on the, in the, in the ranks of the justices of the peace, but she's just been absolutely wonderful. To, to work with and to talk to for many years now. And um, she's um, already very missed. Yep, I, I agree. Um, as I've been for years, the chair of the Montpelier Democratic Committee and tried to recruit people to, uh, to get on the ballot for justice of the peace, I have uh, always appreciated it when people were uh, willing to get on the ballot who are also going to be willing to do the work and uh, and come to the, all those meetings and work on the uh, tax abatement appeals and everything else. And Catherine's uh, willingness to do all that is was definitely appreciated. And I'm hoping we can find someone who will also do that. And city manager's report. Um, just have a couple of things. I hope everyone has a great holiday. 
Uh, with regard to July 3rd, uh, just uh, to the point someone mentioned the weather, I would note that we are, our emergency folks are planning with Montpelier Lab. As some may recall a few years ago, we did have lightning and um, we did have to call it. And uh, so we are going to leave that in the hand, I mean, in the hands of uh, essentially the emergency management people, the police chief and fire chief. So just uh, that's who to yell at, I think. If, <laughs> um, and obviously I'll be consulted in Kelly, um, yeah, but uh, at the end of the day. So I think that's just, you know, hopefully we don't have to, that happen, but we also can't have 10,000 people downtown and, you know, dangerous lightning going off. So uh, we're watching that closely. Uh, hopefully that won't be the case. Uh, a couple of things about the bikes. We talked about those a little bit, and I think that um, for, I, I didn't want to belabor the conversation, but uh, I do think a uh, one complaint we get a lot is from is bicyclists not following rules, running red lights, and those kinds of things. And so um, perhaps we can ask the committee to, as if encouraging people to stay off sidewalks is also to follow the, the rules. Um, obviously, we want safe biking. For everybody, and and um, the reason I asked uh, Corey to repeat the the path is I I just want to be clear. We're talking. We're taking out the parking from Main Street to the Rec Center on that side of Berry Street. We're putting in, and it's a great plan. But I we're going to hear about it, and I want to make sure that everybody understands loud and clear that that's what we're doing. And that uh, it was spoken, asked, and repeated. So that's that's what that plan is. So those two things can't be in the same place. Exactly. And uh, and so obviously we're going to have to do some outreach to the folks that are going to be impacted by it because again that we had a very extensive process, um, an excellent public process, maybe in 2017 or so. 2018, something like that, which decided these things. And here we are at 2023 doing it and people forget. So I, I am sure we will, we will remind people, but it's, you heard it here first. So uh, that's all I have. Hope everyone has a great holiday. Okay. And we are adjourned at 9.23 PM. Thank you, everybody.